uh, uh, e bem-vindos uh, a este a este primeiro uh, seminário. Uh, also, welcome to John and Ernesto. Thank you very much for being uh, here with us. Um, so I will uh, speak English, um, but please feel free to, uh, if you want to ask questions in Portuguese, we will provide uh, help uh, for the translation. So welcome everybody uh, to this first seminar. This is a new series dedicated to the uh, um, topics around citizen participation and deliberation. Um, this is a series that uh, holds uh, three main goals. So the first goal uh, has to do with the uh, scientific debate on these uh, topics. Um, so what I would like to do with this series is to uh, contribute to the scientific debate on current forms of participation uh, in the world by highlighting also the emerging challenges and opportunities of these new forms of participation. Um, more concretely, I have to say that I was um, inspired uh, by the last couple of years and the challenges that the pandemic uh, brought about um, in terms of uh, uh, very different, I mean, multiple issues. I would say one of those issues has to do with uh, um, the digital shift, so actually how forms of participation and deliberation can take advantage of the development of new technologies and how public authorities can also um, enhance their skills to uh, use uh, the digital for uh, these, uh, for, I mean, for new forms of participation. Um, a, a second issue that really um, that I really thought um, interesting to reflect on is uh, the um, degree of preparedness of public authorities to current uh, extreme events and also upcoming uh, risks, global risks, and the way uh, citizen engagement can actually uh, help um, decision makers to take good decisions, to take effective uh, decisions. And uh, also a third component that I thought very um, interesting to think about is also the ways we can uh, promote the engagement of the most um, vulnerable groups of uh, our societies. Um, and I know actually that in Lisbon uh, there has been quite a, an effort to reach um, some of these groups, I think, for example, to uh, the efforts for more youth participation. Uh, so how actually to reach, uh, how to engage young people in these uh, uh, initiatives. The second goal of this uh, seminar series has to do with uh, uh, the strengthening of the channels of communication between the academia and uh, public authorities. So uh, this is a series that uh, has a primary goal to nurture the debate, uh, the policy debate on uh, citizen participation and deliberation. Um, so on, on the one hand, we also want to accomplish the mission of ICS, which is a laboratorio associado, portanto, associate laboratory, I don't know how to translate in English, but so this is an institute that has as a mission to contribute to policy making. So this is also a way uh, to contribute to um, this uh, mission. And uh, um, the third and last uh, goal of this series um, is also um, to prepare um, the conditions for new initiatives and actions that will be promoted in the next few months uh, at ICS, um, especially about the um, possibility to provide new learning opportunities at ICS on the topics of citizen participation and deliberation. So um, I'm kind of preparing this also for the next, maybe 2023, most likely, to provide new learning opportunities on these, on these topics. So, okay, considering these goals, this first seminar uh, wants to start an open dialogue with the New Citizens Council of Lisbon, which is the first citizen assembly uh, of this kind 
promoted in Portugal, if I'm not wrong. <laughs> um, so considering that this initiative actually draws um, inspiration from uh, a long history of deliberative initiatives around the world, um, the seminar relies on the contribution of uh, key scholars. I am very happy uh, to have here uh, John Dreisek, Ernesto Ganunza, but, but also Manela Riaga, and also the participation of the uh, Lisbon City Council. And, uh, but since we acknowledge that there are many aspects that we should unlock about the, uh, these citizen assemblies. Of course, this is the first seminar. This is the first seminar of more seminars that will be announced in the next few days. Um, so now, to <laughs> sum up, I'm very honored to have the, uh, um, these uh, keynote speakers. Let me say just a couple of words about um, John Dreisek, Ernesto Ganunza, Manela Riaga and Lorenzo Jardin. So John Dreisek is a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia, former head of the departments of political science at the University of Oregon and uh, Melbourne, and the, of the social and political theory program at the Australian National University. He is a centenary professor at the Center for Deliberative Democracy and Global Governance at the University of Canberra, Institute for Governance and Policy Analysis and has published extensively on democratic, on democratic uh, theory and practice and environmental politics, being one of the most known theorists of the deliberative turn in democratic theory. Ernesto Ganuza is a senior researcher at the Institute of Public Policies and Goods in Spain and was deputy director at the Institute of Advanced Social Studies in the city of Córdoba. He is a socio sociologist and editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Sociology since 2014. He is one of the most known scholars in the field of participatory and deliberative democracy, and he has been involved in the international research projects and published extensively also on the global dissemination of democratic innovations. He has equally provided expert advice to the implementation of participatory processes at different uh, scales. Then we have... Uh, Manuel Arriaga is a professor at the New York University and founder of the Forum dos Cidadãos, Citizens Forum, an organization that has promoted deliberative initiatives in Portugal. And he has advocated publicly and published extensively also on citizen assemblies and uh, his organization, I mean, the organization that he is leading, um, was invited by the Lisbon City Council to support the implementation of the Citizens Council of these new initiatives. Lorenzo Jardin is an advisor of the Lisbon mayor uh, and one of the members of the coordinating team of the new Citizens Council in Lisbon. And uh, Lorenzo has also dedicated his career to the promotion of citizen participation and deliberation, both internationally and nationally. Then me, my role is, uh, in this session is twofold. On the one hand, I'm a researcher at ICS and I've been doing research on this themes of citizen participation and deliberation for the last few years. And I decided to organize uh, so this uh, seminar series um, um, to also to better position Portuguese uh, um, initiatives uh, uh, within the international debate. Um, um, uh, the, other, the other role that I have in this uh, seminar series is also uh, the, coordinate, the coordinator at ICS of the monitoring and evaluation of the new Citizens Council of uh, Lisbon. Um, this is because I do believe that monitoring and evaluation can uh, uh, very much contribute to the um, effectiveness of these initiatives. Um, for these reasons, I'm also collaborating with the uh, European Commission on the topic of the evaluation of participatory processes. And ICS is also collaborating with uh, uh, the uh, central government uh, on the evaluation of public policies more in general. Um, so, okay, uh, this said, I asked uh, our speaker to have, um, uh, to use freely their uh, time slot of 30 minutes uh, each. So uh, if you want to ask any question to our keynote speaker. Let's see if we have time in those 30 minutes. If not, we have uh, a time slot dedicated to the Q&A. 
And again, feel free to ask your question in English or Portuguese. In case you want to speak uh, Portuguese, we will help with the translation. So again, thank you very much to all of you, of course, but to the speakers of today. And I do hope that we can all make the best out of this uh, seminar and the next uh, seminars. So if you agree, I would leave the floor to John Dreisek. Just let me know, John, if you want me to share your presentation or you want to share on your screen. Um, I think it might work better if, if you do it, Roberto. But the last time I tried this, it didn't work okay. um, from my screen. So, okay. so I'll just um, tell you when. I'll just say a new slide when we need it. When, every time we need a new slide. Yeah, I will share the screen with you now. Can you see? Yeah, that's great. Just. Okay. Please, okay. start when you want. Okay, thank, thank you, thank you, Roberto, for, the, for that introduction, and thank you for inviting me. Um, it's really good to see the Citizens Council happening in Lisbon. Uh, this is part of um, what the OECD, in a recent publication, calls the deliberative way. So, next slide, please. Uh, which a lot of people seem to be surfing. Um, the publication was actually uh, uh, coordinated by um, Claudia Schwalitz, who did a uh, an exhaustive survey of the deliber deliberative practices around the world. Um, so what is deliberative democracy? The, it, the, perhaps the simplest way of defining it is that uh, it involves meaningful communication uh, encompassing citizens and leaders. It is sometimes described as a talk-centric as opposed to a vote-centric view of democracy, although deliberative democrats are not hostile to voting elections. They just think that the, the real substance of politics is to be found in communication. Um, also, talk-centric doesn't quite capture everything about deliberation, uh, because listening and reflection are just as important as talk, and I think that's increasingly recognised um, amongst deliberative theorists. Now, the deliberative wave uh, mostly involves um, me publics, um, including citizens' assemblies, uh, but also citizens' juries, which are generally much smaller, but otherwise operate uh, along similar lines. Uh, Deliberative opinion polls, as invented by James Fishkin, uh, which, as the name implies, are essentially an opinion poll, but um, people get a chance to deliberate before they turn in the, the final questionnaire. And then uh, consensus conferences, um, invented in Denmark and have been around a long time, especially when it comes to uh, citizen deliberation on issues of technological risk. Uh, we can essentially define a mini public um, in terms of its reliance on lay citizens playing, playing a key role, um, recruited generally by stratified random selection, although there may be good reasons to relax this. So relax this criterion. So um, in his opening remarks, um, Roberto mentioned the importance of getting the most vulnerable to participate. And that may mean that um, in order to do that, we, uh, uh, we don't necessarily follow principles of um, the stratified random selection. Um, so for example, um, there's a recent uh, online civic assembly on climate. And I noted that um, in their, their, their more or less random selection process, so they didn't include any participant from the Pacific Islands. Um, indeed, the whole Pacific region was underrepresented. And that's, of course, uh, low-lying Pacific Islands are one of the um, most vulnerable places in the world to the effects of climate change. They have no representation in the citizen assembly. Um, so it, it's important sometimes to uh, uh, think about other criteria. Uh, not just random selection. And sometimes we, we, we may want to represent diversity um, rather than demographics to make sure that we've got um, uh, all relevant points of view, all relevant human experiences present in the, in the, in the mini public. Mm -hmm. Of course, mini publics um, generally also feature presentations by experts um, um, and by advocates on different sides of the issue, if there are such advocates. Um, and those experts and advocates can be questioned by the citizen participants. Uh, those participants should also be provided with balanced information, and all this normally uh, proceeds under the, the, the guidance of a, a facilitator who is there to um, just simply ensure that um, deliberative principles are followed. So in the rest of my presentation, I'm going to uh, 
say a bit about what we know about deliberation in general. Um, so I'll be sort of summarizing some empirical findings. Um, and then I'll draw some lessons uh, for many publics in particular, some very specific, some spe specific lessons, which um, I think uh, many publics need to bear in mind. So next slide, please. Um, so what do we know about deliberation in general? Um, the first thing is that um, uh, people do want to deliberate. Um, my American colleague, uh, Michael Niblo, uh, has found that uh, those most enthusiastic about citizen, uh, citizen deliberation are often those who are most turned off by conventional politics, um, at least in the, the US. Um, I should add a caveat here, although people, it seems, do want to deliberate when you ask them and present them with uh, uh, scenarios in which they can, actually getting them to respond to invitations to participate in a citizens' assembly is a different question altogether, and I'll get to how you do that uh, in, in a moment. Um, second, um, ordinary people are capable of quality deliberation. Uh, this is really the evidence that we have um, just from hundreds, if not thousands, of deliberative processes that have been that have been run. Um, and observers, um, well, generally, uh, well, uh, are impressed by the degree to which lay citizens can deliberate on on com and get their really come to grips with uh, complex issues and the nuances of those issues. Um, again, there's a bit of a caveat. This won't happen automatically. Um, and I, when, I, when I talk about lessons, I'll uh, uh, try and suggest uh, there are there are things we can do to ensure that deliberation uh, does reach high quality levels. Um, the third thing that we know is that citizen deliberators can counteract the manipulation. Uh, this is, uh, I mean, of course, the, the public sphere in in any country really um, is is subject um, to. Manipulation by other politicians, by the media. You know, think of Donald Trump and his manipulation of language in the US and the way he mobilizes people and uh, um, really presents uh, untruths in his framing of issues. Um, we know that uh, generally citizen deliberators can, uh, can you know, given the chance, can see through those kinds of those kinds of framings. Um, and again, we have we have um, some evidence um, from research on many publics that that, that can happen. Um, Fourth, uh, deliberation is an antidote to polarization. Uh, of course, polarization is an increasing problem in politics um, in, in today's world between uh, 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 co competing, compete often well, just, just very different uh, competing camps who often find it difficult to um, recognize the legitimacy of the other side. And of course, the, again, the US uh, exemplifies that problem today. Um, uh, we find that uh, deliberative forums aren't like that, and that it's if if we mix people from different sides of polarized issues, um, they can come to understand one another's point of view. Um, and we have evidence that even if you only have one side um, of an issue present uh, in in a forum, so you, so they don't get to actually talk to people on the other side, um, that can deliberative conditions can actually lead, still lead people to, to moderate uh, their extreme points of view. And there's uh, evidence um, by um, our Finnish co colleagues, um, uh, Kimo Grönland, uh, Kaiser Herner, and Maya Settler, um, who've done work on citizen de deliberation on uh, immigration in Finland, which shows that, that, that effect, that it's an antidote to polarization. Um, related to that, um, deliberation can heal deep division. Um, that may not be a problem in Lisbon, but um, work on divided societies, um, such as Northern Ireland, for example, um, shows how deliberation can promote understanding between people on different sides, historically just very deep uh, political, religious, um, ethnic, national divisions. Um, and then finally, uh, deliberation promotes considered judgment and counteracts populism. Um, again, we, we have... Um, some pretty good evidence of, of how deliberation, uh, how deliberative reasoning can, um, uh, can can take place amongst ordinary citizens um, and lead and lead people to um, think through issues and not simply respond to um, the cues of populist dem demagogues. Okay, um, now let me move to mini publics um, in particular and what what we can what we can say about them. Um, so next slide, please, Roberto. 
Okay, I'll, first I'll say a bit about my, my own contributions to, to designing and, and running many public. So, um, to date, the biggest one I've been involved with um, was one we ran long ago um, in 2009, uh, the Australian Citizens Parliament. And this is a, um, this is a picture, um, oops, uh, back to the previous one. Yeah, yeah thanks. Um, so this is a picture of uh, people deliberating um, in, in small groups at, at the Australian Citizens Parliament. This was, uh, this was very, quite a big event. It was 150 people. Uh, one person more or less randomly selected um, from every electoral district in Australia and we brought together brought them together over um, four days to deliberate a series of questions about um, how to improve the uh, um, Australian citizen political system in order to serve the people of Australia better. Um, more recently I've been involved in uh, uh, organising a, a citizen's jury, um, again, actually it's in the same building as this, this citizen's parliament, but this time it's a citizen's jury, it was about uh, 24 people, so much smaller, um, on the issue of genome editing, um, which is uh, a new technology uh, which has uh, tremendous potential um, when it comes to um, alleviating human suffering, um, and also there's lots of potential applications um, uh, uh, genome editing, not just in humans, but also in, in plants and animals, um, but also comes with significant risks and also provides, gives us um, lots of uh, uh, ethical challenges. So the ethics, um, yeah, the, the, the ethics of no means uh, obvious and it's, uh, uh, in, in, in a way, genome editing sort of uh, forces us to rethink what it means to be a human being if we can edit our own genes. Those are some pretty profound questions. Um, and we saw in the Australian Citizens Jury that um, citizens are perfectly competent to address, to understand and address the ethical questions at, at issue. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, and building on this, um, uh, building on the experience of the Australian citizens jury, but also other citizens juries on this, the same issue which are being held all around the world, um, we're proposing to conduct um, the, what will be the world's first global citizens assembly on the issue of genome editing. Um, these are our, our partners there are uh, Mission Public um, in France and Germany, and then uh, GenePool, which is a uh, documentary film company that we're working with, um, who will, amongst other things, um, produce the world's first deliberative documentary um, on the issue of genome editing and system deliberation. So this, um, excuse me, um, sorry, um, just something stuck in my mouth. Um, okay. Um, this is the, the the idea of a global citizen assembly provides a whole new set level of challenge. I, I won't dwell on it because obviously uh, uh, you're working at the city level from Arrow. Um, but when it comes to multiple languages, um, how, do we, how do we cope with multiple languages? Um, how do we select people on a, a global scale? Uh, random, stratified random selection is, 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 is pretty much impossible to undertake on a global scale. Um, so I think there, we, we do have answers to how you do it, but, but they're very different from um, what, one does, um, what one does locally. We don't yet have the funding for this. Um, we're currently waiting to hear um, a, a grant application for several million dollars, which would enable us to do this, this properly. Um, okay, so let me now turn to um, some, some lessons uh, that I think we've found from research in my, my, my center. Um, for many publics and what, how to think about um, not just how to conduct them, uh, but also to think about their, their larger place. Um, what, what, what is a mini public actually for? Um, and I'll, I'll try and uh, develop some um, ideas about that as well. Um, so next slide, please, Roberto. Okay, uh, first lesson. Um, In-person deliberation is better than online deliberation. Um, obviously, in the, the last two years especially, a lot of deliberation has moved online. And I mentioned the, uh, the Global Citizens Assembly on Climate Change, which actually is, well, it, you know, it, 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 is, it is the world's first Global Citizens Assembly, but it was only, it was only done um, online. 
Um, and I think um, there is, uh, I mean, people who have studied online deliberation um, have often found, well, it depends on the sort of the measures in use, that, um, uh, that certainly you can, you can get deliberation online. Um, but I think um, people who have experienced um, online and in-person deliberation uh, can, can see that there's actually something missing when, when we do it online. And, and in a way, it's the same thing that's missing in my talk to you now. Um, I'm not there physically. Um, I can interact with you in a formal sense uh, with my presentation and then your questions. Uh, but in terms of kind of, uh, I don't know, hanging around together on the edges of the meeting, um, uh, conducting informal discussions, which I think can be a, a very big part of, um, of deliberation, um, those, things, those, those, things, those things are missing. Um, and then uh, some of the things which I, I think um, also enable good deliberation, which I'll talk about um, in a few minutes, um, especially uh, point four here on, on group building, um, those things are much harder to do in an online setting. Um, so if you can, uh, do it in person. Uh, if you have to, uh, then of course, you know, in, in today's world, seeing some online is um, in the time of COVID is the sum has been necessary. Uh, but I think... Uh, it, it's also possible um, to think in, in hybrid terms, to do as much in person as you can, even if you have to do some of it online. Um, okay, one, one, one lesson I forgot to put on this, um, on this slide, and I, I just remembered it um, a few minutes before we would, we, we would do to start this session. Um, and that, that's um, actually even before we get to uh, figuring out how to um, organize deliberation. And that, and that concerns recruitment. Now, um, you know, the, the ideal, uh, so the, the ideal for a lot of people who, who think about many publics is, is stratified random selection. Um, but, um, but getting people, what, what's really important then, uh, it's not just sort of identifying who, who you ask to, to come to the deliberative event, it's how you invite them. It's so important. Um, and I, I was struck, um, I was reading a report from a, a citizens' assembly that was conducted uh, um, in the UK recently, in the United Kingdom recently, and it was on the future, really it was on the future of democracy in the United Kingdom. Um, and as I read through it, um, the response that rate they got from the citizens they contacted was about 1.5%. So only 1.5% of the, the people contacted um, indicated that they would be willing, if selected, to participate in the citizens' assembly. And I wondered why, why was that so tiny? Um, and they, they gave a few explanations uh, as to why that might be the case, but, in, but they, they didn't really convince. Now, contrast that. I mentioned um, earlier the Australian Citizens Assembly, which I helped organise in 2009. Um, the response rate we got for that, we, we contacted around, we sent out letters to around 10,000 citizens throughout the country. And the, 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 the number, the percentage who replied positively, saying that they would participate in what was quite a demanding process if selected, was around 32%, um, which is, given how demanding it is, and, m and most of them would have to travel long distance, long distance to get to um, where we were holding the Citizens Assembly, the city, that's what we call the Citizens Parliament. Um, why did we get a response rate of 32%, whereas the people in the United Kingdom who were running a very similar process only got 1.5%? Um, and my answer um, is, that we, we approached our participants um, in a way that was it, was, it looked really dignified. Um, it looked as though they were going to be part of something of historic importance. Um, they were going to uh, really be, be um, brought to Canberra, to uh, the national capital, to deliberate in, in Old Parliament House in a very dignified setting um, about some key questions about the future of the Australian political system. Um, and we, we printed the, uh, the invitations um, on, it was beautifully, the, the invitations were beautifully crafted um, on you know, very fine paper um, with the, uh, the, the, the logo and the picture of Old Parliament House that, um, uh, that I presented on my earlier slide. Um, it just looks so beautiful. And it was signed by two, two very high profile um, Australian, uh, one politician and one indigenous leader. Um, two very high-profile, very well-known people. So it looked as it looked as though um, they were really being invited to, to take part in something important, something significant. Now, 
The precise details um, may be hard to replicate, but, um, but I can't stress enough the importance of the invitation and just making it look beautiful, making it look dignified, making it look something like something really important and significant that people are being asked to do. Um, and that's how we got 32%. So how you invite people is really important. Okay, so that was, if you like, lesson 1A. Uh, lesson 2, um, don't have too much on the agenda. Um, again, my experience of the Australian Citizens Parliament is relevant here. We had an open-ended agenda, and that was a mistake. Um, we started with the question, how can Australia's system of government be strengthened to serve us better? But we allowed participants to add items and add specific items to that, and they did. Um, right up, um, both in the lead-up to the event and even in the, the first three hours of the event. Um, this was a mistake. Um, actually, it was a mistake I knew we were making at the time, but I, my fellow organisers overruled me. Um, but don't try to do too much. Um, okay, the third um, lesson which is um, related is that deliberation takes time. It takes time for citizens to get to grips with complex issues. How much time? Uh, it depends. It depends. Uh, it really does depend on the, on the complexity of the issue and the number of things that are being asked to deliberate. Um, but as a rough judgment, anything that any, any deliberative process that only lasts one day is likely to be poor quality. Um, improve, we have evidence um, in work I've done with my colleague um, Simon Niemeyer and others uh, that we, we, we see improvements in the quality of deliber deliberation um, as we add um, days to the process. Um, unfortunately, the longest, pro the longest uh, process we've got is, um, is five days, so we don't know if there's any improvements after five days. But certainly as we go um, up uh, you know, e each day uh, that we add to the process, um, up to five at least, um, produces high quality deliberative reasoning. We do, and we have measures of deliberative reasoning, but I, but I don't really have time to go into um, uh, how that's done. Okay. Um, the, the, fourth, the fourth lesson, and this um, may be along with um, the way you invite people, this may be the most, uh, the most important one. Um, and this is the uh, importance of group building in improving deliberative reasoning. Um, and I've got a, a, a paper on this um, that actually is uh, with, with Simon Niemeyer and then our colleague Don Francesco Berry and then um, Andre Bechtiger at the University of Stuttgart. Um, and the, the title of the paper is actually How Deliberation Happens. Um, and the key, the, key, the key finding of the, the paper is the degree to which um, deliberative quality um, improves with group building. So what do I mean by group building? So next slide, please, Roberto. Okay. Um, group building really refers to what, if anything, you do at the outset of the deliberative process. Um, and in, in, our, in our paper, um, we distinguish between five levels. Um, so level one is minimal. Um, this is where the deliberative process begins only with provision of information about what, what, the, what the deliberation is, is going to do, what it's supposed to address, um, without any introductions of participants to each other, um, and without any ice-breaking exercise. Um, so this is the, the very minimal level. Um, it's relatively rare, um, which is a, a good thing. Um, the second level um, is uh, what we call uh, group introductions, where, where simply the, there are formal introductions where the, the, the organisers um, introduce themselves, the citizen participants introduce themselves, um, and experts may be introduced as well. So it's just formal introductions. So again, uh, 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 in, in some ways sort of fairly, fairly minimal. Um, the third group briefing is what is, it's pretty much standard in deliberative process. This is, this is, uh, th this would be the norm. So numbers one and two uh, would be relatively rare. Um, the third level, group briefing, group briefing is much more, much more common. And this is where at the beginning of the deliberative process, the main public, um, in a plenary session, participants are briefed on deliberative norms. They're told what deliberation is. Um, it involves being respectful, um, taking turns, um, uh, you know, uh, just just taking taking you know, well, taking taking the issues seriously um, and so forth. Um, level 
level four um, is what we call participatory group building. And this is where, um, instead of being told at the beginning what deliberation is and what they should do, the participants, the participants themselves work through what norms and rules should apply during deliberation. Um, so, um, I mean, you, you, you tell them sort of in just in very broad terms um, what, what, uh, what deliberation is about, and perhaps in the broad, word, broad terms I used at the outset of this talk, um, where I um, refer to um, meaningful, meaningful communication encompassing um, citizens and leaders. Um, so, um, so, but, but with, with, after that, um, the, the facilitator simply asks the participants um, to work through what rules they think should apply, how, how their interaction should be governed. And usually this takes, um, you know, this can be done in about um, 30 minutes or so, but it's a very valuable 30 minutes. Um, what normally happens is that um, participants themselves um, come up with what look very much like principles of deliberative democracy. Mm -hmm. um, so what does that suggest to me? That there is something about deliberation, uh, which, is, uh, which is a kind of an intrinsic um, human social capacity, uh, which given the chance to think about it, um, people, uh, uh, people can come up with themselves. Um, why is this good? Because it means that the participants uh, think that the rules they're applying are their own rules. It's not somebody else telling them what to do, but they've decided for themselves the rules that should govern their deliberative interaction. Um, so that's level four. Um, level five is, well, we've only actually, it was done um, by my colleague Simon uh, Niemeyer in conjunction with um, a Swedish colleague, um, uh, Julia Jenstel, uh, in, in a Swedish, Swedish mini public, uh, which involved mindfulness training um, at the outset. That's the only time it's ever been done. Okay. Um, the most important thing, and we have evidence on this, we, we measure deliberative reasoning in the process as a whole. Um, and we find that the quality of reasoning uh, amongst citizens over the whole process um, increases as we go from levels one to five. Most important is the jump from three to four. Um, well, uh, okay, that's, that's not necessarily in statistical terms, but um, I think if, you, if you're designing a mini public, I mean, everyone these days pretty much does level three group briefing. But you can achieve real gains in deliberative reasoning if you go to um, level four, participatory group building. Um, and again, we, we have statistical evidence um, uh, for that. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, um, this is actually the, the fifth lesson um, from the two slides ago. Um, we should think about the place of many publics in deliberative systems. Um, and often this isn't done, uh, surprisingly. You know, people put enormous amounts of effort um, into thinking about how to design the mini public. Um, but then they hardly, often they hardly think at all about how it relates to um, other elements of what we can call a deliberative system. Um, a deliberative system, like any system, can be thought of in terms of differentiated yet linked components that can be interpreted in light of some common purpose. Um, and the purpose we generally have in mind as deliberative Democrats um, is authentic, in other words, meaningful, inclusive, all relevant, uh, all relevant um, points of view and people, um, and consequential makes a difference, uh, deliberation. The components of a deliberative system might include um, citizen forums, many publics, but might also include um, a legislature or city council, um, political executives, social movements, political parties, uh, traditional media, um, and social media. Um, and we can think of, again, we can think of many publics as just being one part of this system. Um, and we can see, uh, if, if you look, if you look, look closely, um, what, what difference a many public makes um, in a larger system. Um, sometimes, unfortunately, it makes very little difference at all. Um, the case of Ireland, though, shows how deliberative innovations um, involving citizens and participants, so not exactly many, well, some of them have been many publics and standard citizens and assemblies, but at least uh, uh, one, uh, uh, one process they ran uh, involved lay citizens and politicians mixed. Um, 
And but that um, that set of citizens' assemblies um, seemed to make a huge difference in Irish politics generally. Um, it helped make interactions in the Irish Parliament, um, for example, more deliberative and improve the deliberative quality of the political system as a whole. Um, so, um, in thinking about the place of mini-publics in deliberative systems, I, I think a lot of people, a lot of proponents of mini-publics, um, including some you know, very high-profile ones who have written books recently, like um, uh, Len Landemore, uh, for example, um, uh, uh, and, and others who, who who advocated um, constitutionalizing the role of, uh, of many publics, and in some cases, um, in Lanimore's case, she wants to see them replace um, other political institutions. Um, however, um, one other empirical finding we have, and perhaps this is counterintuitive, um, that the closer the mini public is <coughs> to decision making, the lower the quality of deliberation. Why should that be? Um, the, I mean, it's, it's not a very big effect, but it's, um, but it is statistically discernible. Um, and the, the explanation that, that we've come up with is that, um, the proximity to a decision-making role, um, tends to induce strategic behavior as opposed to deliberative behavior. In other words, participants are oriented to success and influence and winning rather than reflecting on different sides. Um, now that's, a, a, provide, that's a, a real challenge because what it suggests is that um, the, 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 the more consequential the mini publics become, the less authentically deliberative they become. Um, again, it's a very tentative finding, but we do, as I say, we do have a bit of empirical evidence on this. Um, what does this mean? It means that we need to think long and hard about the place of mini publics and deliberative systems. Um, and do we want them to be making decisions? Um, or do we want them in some other role? Um, that role might be uh, trying to make the larger public sphere more deliberative. Um, uh, I do have um, another argument, which I'll turn to in next slide, please, uh, Roberto. Um, which, is, which I developed um, in an article uh, that's published in uh, 2017 in, in Political Theory Journal. Um, and what, um, what, that, what the article built on was the evidence that suggests that the, uh, that, that many, I've already said that many publics, um, uh, uh, citizens in, in many publics can, involve, can engage in uh, effective deliberation. But their real comparative advantage is that the participants can reflect on the merits of different sides. The participants are not necessarily very good at, com at making arguments. They're not necessarily very good at justification uh, compared to, say, um, elected politicians and legislators who are very good at justifying policies or criticizing policies on the other side. Uh, the comparative advantage of, of citizens in many public is in reflection, not in justification. Um, so I like to uh, compare it to um, uh, the, the idea of a jury trial, where you have um, uh, two chambers. A chamber of justification, which is the courtroom itself, where you have lawyers from different sides um, arguing the merits of, uh, uh, of the guilt or innocence um, of, the, of the defendant, usually. Um, and then you have a jury room. Uh, the jury hears the arguments in the in the courtroom itself, then retires to the jury room and reflects on the merits of the arguments that they've heard. Mm. Um, what this suggests is that we can think of, uh, of many publics as sites of reflection um, uh, in, 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 in a deliberative system. Um, actually, I, um, sorry, ignore the, in, in, in the, the, the middle, the middle uh, sentence of, sorry, the mid, middle, section of that slide, it says, and decision. That's really referring to a jury. Um, I don't, that's one of the things that I think is questionable, as my previous point should suggest about perils of proximity to decision making. Um, but what it suggests is that um, uh, maybe we should think about the place of many publics and deliberative systems as being a bit like an upper house in a parliamentary system. 
Um, traditionally, the role of the second chamber or other house has been as a house of review. Um, but elected upper chambers, um, um, in many cases, um, simply replicate the role of the lower chamber. Um, because um, they, they're composed of politicians from the same parties who um, often see their, their job in, in very similar terms as uh, the members of the lower house. Um, what this suggests is that if, that, that if we're thinking about constitutionalizing mini publics, um, we should not necessarily think of them as advisory inputs into the political system, but we should think of them as something like a house of review, um, which reviews the arguments uh, that have been presented um, in the in the lower chamber. Um, this doesn't necessarily, being a house of review, doesn't necessarily mean that you have decision-making authority, but it means that you do have the capacity to uh, reflect, review, um, and uh, produce, um, produce, produce recommendations. Um, so that's just, um, that's just one way of thinking about the, the role of, uh, um, of many publics and deliberative systems. Um, let me just conclude with, with a note of caution. Um, the deliberative wave um, is normally celebrated, as the OECD did, um, in terms of the spread of many publics um, around the world. But many publics themselves are not enough to cure the ills of the political system. Um, and I think the case of Brazil uh, really is a cautionary lesson here. Um, Brazil has been celebrated um, by deliberative and participatory Democrats over the years for the, uh, the, the number, the power, of, uh, of, of, of innovative citizen deliberative processes they've instituted. Um, participatory budgeting is the uh, most well-known one, but um, so for example, um, uh, health councils um, have a huge role, um, huge citizen deliberative role in, uh, in health policy um, in, uh, in Brazil. Um, and yet, you know, so you have all this going on, and then Brazil elects Bolsonaro. Uh, an authoritarian populist as president. Um, so that suggests that there has to be more to life uh, than many publics. And that's the more to deliberative life than many publics. And that's, uh, I'll conclude that. <laughs> wow. I'm sorry, you could not hear the applause from uh, from our oh, <laughs> sorry yeah, yeah. I was okay. I was muted but thank you very much this this was a very yeah. much inspiring uh, speech actually and I and I and I love the conclusion I have to say um, well I think that we have uh, like five minutes if we want to you know if we want to use the 30 minute slot so in case you have any question to John um, we can collect a couple of questions. If not, uh, we can use the Q&A uh, later. So, yeah, Giovanni, uh, uh, no, but you need, the mic. you need the mic. No, you, uh, <laughs> Hello, um, I'm Giovanni Allegretti. I'm a researcher here in Portugal. John, oh, can, sorry. Can, John, can yeah. you hear? Can you hear me? There seems to be a bit, there's a bit of an echo. I, Let me... Uh, maybe you're... No? Can you, can you hear me now? Okay, I can hear you. Okay, yeah. Uh, I, I just came yesterday night from Strasbourg, uh, the Conference on the Future of Europe, so I have <clears throat> three days of deliberation, very fresh. And in an interview, uh, one young guy was told was telling me that uh, effectively what you said about uh, pre exposure to difference uh, in uh, in presence event is very important. They became more radical when they met the difference uh, inside the uh, European countries, and they decided to be much more radical in their proposal. But my question is on another thing. In, in the system you presented, uh, I, 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 I miss maybe uh, the direct democracy issue, and I was wondering, um, in a system, what can be the role 
of direct democracy because direct democracy is uh, usually polarizing, but maybe in the end of a process uh, of deliberation, it could be useful to extend uh, the audience that is exposed to the process, uh, amplifying the effects. So I wanted to, to, to have your view on that. <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, that the yeah the, the, the conference in um, the, the Citizens Conference on the Future of Europe. Um, because that was one of the organisers uh, Mission is Mission Public, who are our partners in trying to organise the, uh, the Global Citizens Assembly. Um, but yeah, the role of direct democracy. Um, I didn't say anything about that. Um, in fact, I, I, didn't, uh, I was I thought I was running short of time, so uh, I didn't include it. But um, if by direct democracy you mean um, referendum. Uh, then I think um, uh, many publics can be very usefully joined to direct democracy. Um, and the, the best example of this um, comes from the US and the, uh, the, uh, the state of Oregon. Um, I used to live there a long time ago. Uh, but uh, they, uh, they organize something called the um, Oregon Citizens Initiative Review. Um, citizens Initiatives are referendums, um, and they're well, citizens, they're, they're, in Oregon, they, they hold um, uh, a, a referendum on maybe up to 20 issues every two years. Um, so you have this enormous, um, enormous long ballot paper, and you get to vote um, on the questions from you know, anything from closing down a nuclear power plant to uh, reforming a tax system to uh, mandatory prison sentencing. Um, so you have about 20 of these things to, to vote on. Um, but when I lived there, I, I thought, actually thought that it was a pretty bad system uh, because uh, 20 items was, was too much. And uh, generally the, 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 the side that won was backed by um, a very well-financed um, campaign. Uh, and the idea of the Citizens Initiative Review is to make this whole process more deliberative by conducting a citizens panel, essentially a citizens jury, um, on a referendum question uh, before the vote and then uh, communicating the results to the voters. Um, and this, in Oregon, this, this is done in, uh, um, essentially it's a, it's every voter gets a booklet before the election. Um, and as part of this book, booklet, they get the, the report of the citizens' jury. So every every voter gets a chance to read that. Doesn't matter, doesn't mean they will read it. At least they get the chance to. Um, and so that um, uh, that at least is uh, one way of um, getting mini public deliberation and combining it with um, with with direct democracy. Um, so uh, John Gastel is the person um, who's written very extensively on the Oregon Citizens Initiative Review, and so I recommend uh, his. His work on that. Thank you very much, uh, John. I have a couple of questions, but I will use the Q and A slot. So yeah. I give. We have time to give the stage to Ernesto. Ernesto, um, do. Deserve uh, deserve my, my my speed. Yeah, I give you the superpower. <laughs> Try to share the screen now. Yeah, it works. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to, to listen to your set. I love the about the democracy. With him and his books and papers, so uh, it's, it's really a, a pleasure to listen. And uh, anyway, for me, I don't know what to do <laughs> after this. You know, <laughs> 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 what can I, what can I talk about the liberty democracy? I think that I'm going to just following Roberto Marx. Uh, just I'm going to to be a little more. I don't know, just to say, to think about the, the Lisbon Citizens Council, uh, what the city wants to, to organize. It's like a permanent deliberative experience. 
So I'm going to think, uh, I'm going to show you uh, two different models are organized just now in Europe in different parts and just to invite you to reflect about how can be organized this permanent deliberative experience. Of course, there are a lot of things to think about, just many of them, uh, John just says, has point, uh, but uh, I hope everything here is, 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 is useful for, for your initiative in the Lisbon city, that is going to be one of the first cities in Europe uh, to do a, a permanent derivative experience. Just before thinking about that, I, I, I think that all people who work around derivative experience uh, need to, 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 to say some different key features of experience because deliberation is, is not very easy, it's not something uh, spinning from the water. <laughs> uh, you, you, you have to organize, you have to think a lot of, a lot of things. You need to start uh, prepare um, uh, space, um, dynamics. So it's, mm, it's quite necessary to think about the, that the participation by lot is quite important because um, just the, the draw guarantees a descriptive representation of the community. So it allows you to, to, to have a, a mini public of the community where you are going to work around. So it's quite, the lot is, is, uh, is, is as another way to think the public debate about public policies, improve public debate, because it's divers the diversity of people, but it's not only diversity of people, it's just maybe what John said, Told before this is a is is a very nice way to 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 grow to good building and it grounds it improves the deliberation a lot. Usually the the selection by lots is made just now in the experience in Europe in two track moments. First is a, an invitation by lot. Everyone can really have the invitations. Uh, once, for, for example, just in the last one experience here in Spain, in the in the regions of Valencia and the Mediterranean Sea about uh, mental health it was quite interesting. They invite nine thousand people in all around the region, and they receive. Uh, the, a positive answer of 5% of the 9,000, just around 500 people, 400, 450 people. They, they, they answer that they, they, they would like to, to, to <coughs> in the second track moment, is a, a, stratified, a stratified pool of participants regarding sociodemographic uh, features of the community. So you can have a descriptive representation of the community. And it, it, it just to, to do a selection by lot needs time. Just it's no it's not something you do very easy in just a couple of days. You need time. Uh, after that, you after you, you have the participants, you, you have to think about the the deliberative dynamic because it's it's something. It's, it's, it's as you said, says, it's people learn things and talk between them and with experts. But it's no something magic. It's, it's, there are a lot of people have thought around the best dynamic, how to, 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 to allow expertise, knowledge, information, uh, going all around the, the, the deliberative space just to to make people think and reflect about the political issues we are we are, we are discussing. Uh, so one of the things more important maybe is something just said is there enough time to deliberative dynamics. 
for example, in Europe, that must now now the the use the average the average time is forty hours per political issue is around five entire days of discussions. Of course, this it doesn't mean that you can't do uh, deliberative dynamic with less time, but as Giselle said, it's very related to the quality of deliberations. More days is more quality, is more quality, less days, less quality, because you don't have a lot of time, because it, people have to learn a lot about issues they really don't know anything, or just they are lay citizens, and what we want is press is, is just give them information to be able to face a problem and to think with the common sense. So you need time for that. And of course the, 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 the second the, the, the last one of the last things is uh, uh, just to what we are going to, to discuss. It's no uh, 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 it's not a very it's, it's very important question. Uh, just up to now, uh, you can you can see that people have discussed the, from general problems to urban planning and infrastructure, concrete things in local uh, communities. But uh, it's quite important because this point uh, links the deliberative experience to the deliberative system. So you, it's quite important what is going to be discussed. Uh, for example, when people discuss around things that are very important for this community and they are, there is a, a, a big discussion in the community, the relation is going to be better because people is going to be involved in a more direct manner. That's the thing about it. Um, and just here is where you can find two different models with respect of the related experiment. So this experience is ad hoc physicist assemblies, just uh, they are uh, experience set up just to, uh, to, to discuss one political issue. Once people debate, the assembly experience finish and um, the assembly disappear. And the second model is what Lisbon wants to organize, that is a permanent cities assemblies. And there are not a lot of experience. Just here now is German region in Belgium is organizing once. Paris is starting with another another uh, permanent cities assembly. And Madrid was hard what's model before. The last thing we have to, 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 to think about the deliberate experience is what we are going to do with political recommendations. It's quite important to give room, to, 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 to be quite very transparent with the destiny of the political recommendations of the deliberate experience. Usually, in the experience, in now in Europe, for example, parliament or municipal councils receive recommendations to integrate them into public policies. It's not a very easy task because citizens are no technicians, are no political representatives, so what they do, what they write, what they are able to, 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 to say, is a, is a political recommendation that sometimes is not easy to articulate into political uh, statements. So it's no easier, for example, just now the regional, the German regional um, parts in Belgium, they, uh, the politicians used to say that they have problems to articulate the, how people make recommendations and how they can translate these recommendations into, into polit uh, policies in the parliament. It's important to, 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 to that, that's important. Uh, the, 
There are other ways that before assuming recommendations and governments organize a referendum. Uh, this is a, in here in Europe, a very uh, uh, a way Irish government makes uh, the last years because they debate uh, important issues in the, polit in the national and political life. And before assuming these recommendations, Government organizes a referendum, like like uh, some parts of, of the state of Oregon in the USA. And of course, the experience, deliberative experience, uh, usually political recommendations are followed up by citizens in a special body just created to do that. Uh, usually, there is a political commitment to to accountability. Um, this is a very, a very, uh, a very fast summarize of the deliberative experience. But I want to 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 present how work permanent citizen assemblies just to 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 give you some idea of what is going on in other play in other place. Just to to try to 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 make a. a a better picture, I need to compare two models because it's better to, to see the difference, uh, the difficulties, uh, just being able to compare two different models. I want to start with Belgian model. Is there, we have to notice that, to notice that in Belgium, in the German speaking part of Belgium, it's very small region, it's just around 1,000 inhabitants. They have, the parliament is 25 seats, and they decide with unanimity just to, to organize this permanent deliberative body. Uh, the idea is uh, they, they, it's quite important this model because it was the first one, and for example, the Paris model is very similar and many different um, parts are thinking always the, 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 the permanent deliberative bodies thinking about this Belgian model. They organize a city council, a permanent city council with 20, 25 people. The members are selected by lots. And one very important thing is that participants rota is a rotation continually. It means that, for example, one third of members change every six months. In that way, people is unable to stay much more than 12 or 18 months in the city council. The idea is very important for the deliberative experience, just because in this way it's impossible to, you know, to, 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 to to be sick in your, in your experience, mm -hmm. and more people can really participate, and it's quite better for the quality of the relation in, the, in their own model. Uh, one of the most important things with the permanent uh, assemblies is the political agenda. How, what is going to be discussed is no how they organize that. In Belgium, they have three different sorts of political agenda, political issues. One is citizens in the in the, in the Belgium, in the region of Belgium, they can make proposals if they are able to to to, to gather 100 signatures in support of the proposal. Political parties in Parliament can make proposals directly to the city councils. And of course, the third one is members of city citizen council can do a proposal to, to be discussed. Whatever the proposal can, if citizens' proposals or political parties or even members of city councils, all of them has to be discussed in the city councils to decide if they 
if they are going to organize a, a um, um, citizen jury to discuss the concrete political issue. Mm -hmm. For example, just as up to now, in, in Belgium, they organize just one citizen jury to discuss. They just finished um, like a few months ago. And uh, they are thinking that, for example, uh, in, in the rules, they were they 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 thought to organize around three citizen juries per year, but they just now, after the first experience, they thought that it was going to be much too much, so they decided just to, to, to do just one citizen jury per year, and of course the citizen council. Uh, is going to, to follow up recommendation, the recommendations made for the citizen juries. And one of the, 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 the roles they have is monitoring public policies in general for, for the public policies. This is a, more or less the budget model. And I'm going to present the, the Madrid model. It's, it's uh, the, the citizen assembly, or the, what is the citizen council, it's very similar to the budget model, but since here in Madrid was um, 49 members. Members were selected by lot. Participants rotate every six months just to, to avoid that participants can stay a long time in the citizens. What really changed here is uh, the, the way uh, the, the, assam the deliberative assembly was articulated with the city. In general, because the proposals uh, were not sent directly to citizens. Just in Madrid, the, there there is a, a digital platform very famous in the world because it's used by many different cities. Uh, it's a, where citizens can make proposals. Uh, in this way, the political agenda of the citizen assembly is made from the digital platform. The most bold proposals of the digital platform is discussed in the citizen assembly. The idea is that the citizen, the citizen assembly evaluates the proposal in the digital platform and they, have, they are able to reject or improve the proposal. And to do that, the assembly works in a very similar way uh, as John said explained before. That experts give information, people, members of the assembly can claim for different experts to give light on the Proposals, different views, and, um, and then members, uh, the 49 members, discuss the proposals and they project or improve the, 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 improve the, the proposals. But the most important thing they have to decide is if proposal is worth marking to a local referendum. Because the, 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 the Madrid government uh, Organizing the citizen assembly decide to to to, to do a, always a local consultations about the issue divided in the assembly. If proposal, if citizen assembly uh, agree to submit the, uh, the proposal to a local referendum, municipal government is going to organize a local consultation. Uh, and of course, the assembly has the same features as the Belgium, follow up recommendations made by the citizen assembly, uh, monitoring public policies in general of, Madrid, of, municipal, of municipality. And once they finish with one proposal, they come back to evaluate the second most bold proposals in the platform digital. In this way, it was a, 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 
a very uh, an interesting way how to link citizens in the city with the with the citizens assembly and the deliberative um, systems uh, just going through always by the digital path. Um, that's all. I'm going to stop here. Um, obrigado for everything. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ernesto. Also, a very inspiring uh, talk. Uh, a lot of ideas and inputs. Uh, we have five minutes. Um, so, if you want to ask any question or uh, you know make some comment, we can use these five minutes. If not, we can use the Q and A slot. Yeah, uh, I give you the mic. Good morning, thank you. I would like to, to know with you. Okay, okay. Uh, hello, uh, thank you for your presentation. I would like to know more about the uh, Madrid experience and if you uh, can talk as about just briefly. Uh, on the subjects, on the themes that the uh, assembly in Madrid have uh, sent to referendum. Ernesto, did you listen? Or do can you, can yeah, okay. So the question is about the topics, the issues that were um, debated yes. in Madrid and uh, which of them were sent to referendum, basically. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, it was a bit because uh, the, the, go the municipal government uh, organized the citizen assemblies just at the last moment of the legislature, um, few months before uh, elect municipal elections. So they have time just to discuss one proposal. Uh, it was uh, the most voted at the moment uh, was uh, how to make city more uh, open to children, more life, more, more well, better for children. So they were discussing this proposal during four sessions, four weekends, and at the end they decide not to submit to referendum the proposal. Uh, so and at this moment, the, 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 the municipal elections change the government and the new government stopped this way. So I think that it was a bit because it's a very different way to organize the relative experience as we see normally here and now in the municipalities. But the organization, the, the, the design is quite interesting. Quite inspiring to think back to, to think a uh, relative experience. Uh, Ernesto, sorry, before uh, just to just to make it clear. So uh, this uh, uh, idea of the let's say child-friendly city. I don't know how to, but uh, it was not uh, uh, sent to referendum because of a political decision or for any other technical issues. For the no. For, for okay, for what was a political decision. Okay. Okay, Ernesto, thank you very much. I would uh, give the stage now to Manuela Riaga. And uh, Manuel, do you want? Yeah, maybe it's easier. I can. Maybe, so you can see also. Oh, put in there. Pois, deixa-me. Isto funciona? Funciona. Embora neste contexto quase nem seja necessário. Por isso, viva, bom dia a todos e obrigado ao Roberto por organizar isto. É um prazer estar aqui. E o meu papel aqui hoje é um bocadinho fazer de, de, uma tradução, para, do, pelo menos a minha perspectiva, é trazer um bocadinho para o contexto português 
uh, boa parte daquilo que ouvimos uh, o John Dreis e o Ernesto partilharem agora um, e vou fazê-lo da seguinte forma, vou fazê-lo da perspectiva de alguém que em Portugal é pá, um, aquilo que chamam um practitioner, não é? Somos uma, integra uma, uma pequena associação que tem, se tem dedicado a promover a género de processos um, e não de uma perspectiva académica. Uh, isso é um outro chapéu pá, que não, não está aqui, pelo menos, que eu não estou a usar hoje. E, dado isto, eu tinha pensado fazer uma intervenção bastante mais breve do que a meia hora que o Roberto generosamente me tinha cedido. Um, e, se calhar, vou começar por vos descrever um pouco o caminho é, que foi feito até agora na organização destes processos em Portugal, tanto quanto eu conheço. É bem possível que uh, eu omita algum processo que tenha acontecido em Portugal do tipo de uma Assembleia de Cidadãos, e se assim for, e o conhecerem. Por favor, eduquem-me, porque eu gostaria muito de saber mais sobre ele. Um, vou partilhar também os, o, as iniciativas que temos atualmente em curso é, no âmbito de promover a utilização da, deste modelo das Assembleias de Cidadãos, também cá em Portugal. E, em seguida, se calhar vou explorar duas ou três questões que são muito, muito frequentes da minha experiência é, destes últimos anos ao discutir este tema cá. Porque um, algo que eu já detectei é nós ouvimos o John Dreisek ou o David Farrell ou o John Gastel falar sobre estes temas. Muitos de nós, pelo menos é certamente o meu caso e talvez de alguns de vós, uh, assim, dizemos que sim com a cabeça e faz-nos todo o sentido, mas quando falamos da aplicação exatamente destes mesmos modelos cá em Portugal, uma, toda uma série de receios e hesitações se ativam de imediato. E por isso eu penso que parte, entendo o meu papel aqui hoje como em parte trazendo um, para a discussão estes receios que se nos ativam. Será que cai é diferente? Uh, o que, como é que isto poderia funcionar cá? Um, talvez num contexto académico não sejam tão aplicáveis, de me e estamos aqui hoje no ICS, por isso Talvez estas questões não sejam tão prementes, mas, pelo menos na minha experiência, quando tentamos trazer isto para a sociedade civil como um todo em Portugal, há aí um par de questões que são inescapáveis e penso que podem ser úteis, pode, pode ser útil que as debatamos brevemente. Mané, desculpa, desculpa. Roberto, conta-me, interrompe-me. Posso só pedir para fazer isto em inglês? Para ah, ok, ok. Termos... Ok. So, let's, should, I, should I start over? Ok. Yeah. Ok. <laughs> Uh, Just to give the chance of course, to the, John and Ernesto to... So, uh, certainly. So, okay, greetings. Mind, so, let's hit the rewind button <laughs> now. And, uh, um, okay, greetings. So, uh, my name is Manuel Arriaga. I'm delighted to be here today. I think I, sh I didn't get a chance to rehearse my participation to my intervention today, but I thank Roberto because now I get a second run. Um, and I, I am here today not so much as an academic, but instead as a practitioner. In particular, um, I am here in the capacity, in my capacity as one of the organizers um, involved in a small NGO in Portugal dedicated to the promotion of citizen assemblies and similar processes. Um, my goal here today for these 30 minutes that Roberto, who just ran out of the room, I think the, that's a hint of some sort, uh, generously granted me, um, is to um, kind of bring to a Portuguese context um, the experiences and uh, expertise that we've just heard from the two previous participants. And um, in doing so, I will try to uh, tell you a bit about the experiences similar to a citizen's assembly or a citizen jury that have already happened in our country, uh, at least those that I know of. And as I mentioned earlier, please do let me know if I miss uh, one or more uh, previous experiences in this field in our country. And uh, then I will try to discuss some of the more common questions and doubts that invariably come up when outside an academic context here in Portugal we discuss these same processes, uh, very often there's quite a good bit of concern about how this would play out in practice. And this is something that I find might not be as directly applicable in an academic setting such as the one where we are meeting today. But nonetheless, I think it's worthwhile discussing them because these processes, to the extent that we succeed in implementing them in Portugal, will necessarily require not just the participation and agreement of academics, but of the broader civil society. So therefore, I, th I think such a discussion will be a, a fruitful use of our time. And towards the end, I will very briefly bring up a couple of points which I think um, are the direction towards which we should uh, move in Portugal in trying to implement this same, um, to 
can bring citizens assemblies and similar processes to greater adoption in our uh, in our country so without further ado uh, a little bit of a retrospective um, on what has happened so far and i'm going to focus over the past in the period of the last five years because that's as far back as my knowledge about this topic reaches. So as far as I know, the first process similar to a citizen's assembly in Portugal happened uh, actually with the participation of an ICS affiliated researcher, Marina Costa Lobo, and a colleague at the Universidade de Aveiro, who in 2017 ran at the request of the government uh, a, a session called uh, Citizen Questions to the Government. Um, Perguntas, dos, Perguntas ao Governo was the title in Portuguese. And this involved the random, the stratified, using stratified sampling, as discussed previously, the random recruitment of a, a few tens of Portuguese citizens who were tasked with coming up with a set of questions to present to the Prime Minister and some select members of government and on the public policies that had been implemented over the first year um, of, the, of the government uh, up to 2017. And this process got quite, I don't know if some of you remember this, but it, got, it triggered quite some media coverage at the time for reasons that some of which I would very much like us to discuss when we discuss the common misunderstandings and concerns that come up in Portugal when we try to implement processes of this nature. But this was, as far as I know, the first time that a randomly recruited panel of Portuguese citizens was asked to perform some kind of political task. And obviously, I'm using the term very loosely here, um, because asking questions of, a, of government, of cabinet members, um, well, I would call it a political task, but it's, it's not exactly on the same level or of the same nature as formulating public policies or evaluating public policies um, or selecting one among a menu of public policies as is commonly done in citizens' assemblies and citizen jury processes. Um, so after that initial experience, um, in, in 2000, well, actually in 2017 too, uh, or my apologies, in early 2018, I believe that was the case, my memory might be failing me, um, um, Forum dos Cidadãos, with, uh, with the backing of um, the Instituto de Filosofia da Universidade Nova de Lisboa, as well as Instituto Globenk de Ciência, um, organized a process uh, that lasted for one weekend, during which a sample of Portuguese citizens, but then again, I use the term, this sample term here, uh, we should put a very large asterisk next to it, because this was a sample of Portuguese citizens who happened to live in the greater Lisbon metropolitan area, okay? So <laughs> that's, uh, there, there was this sample of uh, uh, Portuguese citizens that was uh, brought to uh, FCSH, very close to where we find ourselves today, and had the opportunity to with uh, after listening to uh, representatives from the the two largest Portuguese parties for, and a number of uh, a couple of academic and media uh, personalities to deliberate on how the communication between citizens and their elected representatives might be improved and again this was a process that, that unfolded for a weekend it involved roughly 20 participants so we are talking about the very smallest scale known at least to me of processes that we might call in, uh, citizen juries or citizen assemblies. I use the two terms interchangeably, although, as John Dreisick mentioned early on, there is uh, typically the term citizens assemblies uh, is, re is restricted to larger and longer processes than any of those that we have organized in Portugal so far. They were in international parlance, I believe they would be commonly called citizen juries due to their more reduced uh, size and their shorter duration. Um, this process, um, towards the end of this process, there was a, we, we got some connection with political institutions that was possible. It was possible to organize. So the the Portuguese, the, the president of the Portuguese Republic at the time received the participants and their recommend their their the report with their recommendations and uh, delivered a, a, a pleasant and very skilled presentation on uh, bringing together some of those ideas. 
uh, that he had just heard from the participants. And there was also a public event presenting this to the media and to, to the, the, the broader members of the public who were interested in getting the um, access to these same uh, ideas. Um, one year later, in 2018, there was a process organized on the topic of the the so-called refugee crisis uh, uh, in the European Union uh, with the support of the um, Secretaria de Estado uh, dos Assuntos Europeus um, as, and also as part of this European Commission initiative known as Citizen Dialogues uh, that brought together over two weekends um, in Teatro Maria Matos uh, and also with the participation of that institution um, over two weekends, two groups of roughly 25 participants also selected uh, using a stratified random sampling to, the, again, an asterisk is worthwhile bringing up here again because uh, <laughs> we, we, these processes were always done in the greater region area. So this is by no means can anybody with a straight face claim that these are uh, a sample of Portuguese <laughs> people that is by any means representative, even purely on geographic terms, without going into other demographic or socioeconomic dimensions. But nonetheless, this was a, a second process that also used, or a third process that also used this method. And the topic up, up for discussion was how might um, Portugal, um, which policies should be put in place and to, in face of the influx of refugees, in particular across the, uh, the Mediterranean and, and, uh, and the Turkish uh, Greek border. Um, this was also a very short process. It lasted a total of two weekends. Um, and the, the recommendations were delivered uh, in the, as part of this Citizens Dialogue Initiative of the European Commission, together with the Secretary of State uh, dos Assuntos Europeus. Um, a third process uh, that uh, we have had the opportunity to implement happened at the municipal level with the Câmara Municipal de Oeiras uh, in 2020, right before the start of the pandemic. It was, I believe it was January or very early February. And it involved uh, also a few tens of residents in Oeiras, selected also uh, using this methodology of the, an attempt at stratified random sampling of the residents of that municipality with the goal of, and this was in, in, uh, with the support of Instituto Globen and Ciencia, which is domiciled as uh, several of you, I'm sure, are aware, in Waiters itself, hence the, the connection. And um, this process had as its goal the, organ the formulation of the citizen science initiatives of the municipality, of the city government in Waiters. So these, in short, were the four processes using Roughly speaking, and again, we are no, we are all aware of the deviation. Well, we are, we are to different extents aware of the deviations from this gold standard that we heard about earlier today. But these are the pilots, so to speak, that we've had so far that I'm aware of in Portugal of citizen assembly or citizen jury-like processes. Um, and currently, uh, what is happening? Well, there's the Conselho dos Cidadãos uh, <laughs> here in Lisbon about to take off. And uh, there is also an initiative that has been going on for two years now uh, with the support of the Gulbenkian Foundation uh, that we are organizing uh, in 11 schools currently that brings this same methodology and logic to a different setting, in particular to the school setting. And this is an, uh, a very cool and innovative project um, that is basically trying to bring two students uh, roughly between the, well, from 30, 12, 13 years upwards, and um, the opportunity to organize a government count, a go, uh, student government in their school, not by running for elections as part of a list to see basically tur quickly turning into a popularity contest to see who is the most popular set of students in, 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 in the school, but instead, Random, randomly selected through, an, uh, through, through a sortition process in the context of, of the school. And then uh, this approximate, the student council, as we call it, uh, entailing roughly 15 students from Terceiro Ciclo, I believe in English that would be middle school, if I'm not mistaken, uh, would be 
uh, work deliberatively to generate proposals for improving their school experience the, with the, 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 the facilitation and the deliberative process, so my apologies, with the deliberative process being um, carried out by high school students of the same school. So basically, we train the high school students in some facilitation techniques and processes, and then the high school students oversee and facilitate, acting as mediators, the work of the middle school students who integrate and make up this student council. So this is a, a process currently uh, for the past two years um, that has been that is ongoing currently and uh, it has reached 11 schools by now and that we look forward to expanding um, so that this recipe, so to speak, of citizens' assemblies is not restricted to the usual political settings but, none the, but instead can reach a wider audience. Um, so... My retrospective and present uh, summaries end here. So um, we, I, I might take this time to briefly bring up the three questions that I've identified very often come up when we discuss citizens' assemblies in Portugal. And one of them is um, what most those of you who remember the, the, the Perguntas ao Governo event in 2017 might remember that the media coverage overwhelmingly focused the issue of participants being compensated for their time. So the government is paying people to participate in something like this. What a sham. And that was a very, very common reaction. And this is also a reaction that we get very often when we propose this idea, and not just from um, political personalities, uh, from political uh, institutions or the office holders whom we address. Even in everyday discussions, uh, when you bring up the idea that citizens should be compensated for their time and effort in the process of this nature, you will get, at least in my experience, I hope yours is different, uh, so people telling about, obviously, it's their duty, it's their civic duty to get engaged. And typically, the person usually follows up, sometimes by explicitly saying it, sometimes by hinting at it, look at me, I'm an engaged citizen, why shouldn't the others be too? And there is this, this is a, a judgment that I find very problematic because, uh, again, we all know how uh, asymmetrically distributed the opportunities for participation are. And an overwhelming body of empirical research tells us that compensating participants has an effect in reducing that asym those asymmetries that keep people from participating in political processes. In particular, we know that socioeconomic uh, folks who are less privileged in economic terms will be more present in participatory processes if there is some kind of compensation being offered for their time and effort. And furthermore, some of us would argue, myself included, that uh, people who are doing work should be compensated for their work, and that civic work is not fundamentally different from other forms of labor. And in particular, we can refer to the Anglo-Saxon model, where, at least in the US, that's, I know that to be uh, the, the case for a fact, you get paid a wage when you are serving on, a, on, a, on the jury pool on the in the court system. So if you are giving your time to fulfill your civic duty as a member of a court jury, you are effectively paid a wage. Your work is compensated by the state for doing so. And I would like this logic to be more amply recognized in our country because, again, we are, I believe, in general, very quick to pass judgment and say it's a matter of civic responsibility. You are, you are, who, who would consider paying participants to engage? And this is a really important uh, aspect, point of um, that not only did we, um, not only do we know this, uh, the effects of not doing so, but even current best practices as embodied in the report that uh, John Dreisick mentioned earlier on by the OECD, mentioned that an international best practice involved in this process involves compensating participants, and there's good reason to do so. So um, this is certainly one point that often comes up. A second point that very often comes up in these discussions in Portugal is this notion that uh, it's what, what I like to call Portuguese exceptionalism is, oh yeah, this might w you might listen to John Dreisek say that hundreds or thousands of studies worldwide show that this works and uh, that citizens are competent, but we are different, okay? Here, 
all hell would break loose and we are amazingly stupid or incompetent or dishonest or and this obviously should be something that should be treated more in a in a probably in a in a in a kind of a psychological uh, pop psychological discussion but uh, which i won't go into but th this i also know for a fact from my limited experience that defending and promoting this kind of process in our country invariably brings up the question oh but that works in canada oh yeah that's ireland oh yeah that's poland oh, oh yeah that's spain so as it comes closer to home i hope the the absurdity of this argument becomes more evident because kind of is the rest of the world spectacular and are we uniquely stupid and incapable well that doesn't seem to be the case in my experience, but I don't, you tell me about yours. So, uh, so that's the second point that uh, we very often stumble upon, and the third one, uh, which and I'll, I'll stop here, not to not to bore you with preemptive questions which haven't even come up, but I tell you they do come up. <laughs> that's why I can go over this from memory because I've had these conversations a number of times by now. Is um, oh. But you, 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 you just haven't. Got, well, I, I will quote my, uh, a Colombian friend uh, who lives here in Lisbon, uh, and whose expression was "pero y se salen todos fachos," uh, which is especially over the last couple of years here in Portugal is basically the concern about extremist and anti-democratic ideals and values kind of being empowered by this kind of processes. And again, here, and without having nowhere near the authority with which my, the other participants on this panel might do so, speaking about international experiences, as far as I've ever found in my own research, there is no documented instance of any kind of anti-democratic or extremist position being empowered by a deliberative process involving ordinary citizens, selected at random, unlike what happens with elections pretty much <laughs> every day around the world, right? So this sort of concern is utterly historically unfounded, as far as I can tell. I make categorical statements, again, possibly reflecting my own ignorance about something that happened in some remote part of the, or not so remote part of the globe, but grosso modo, as far as I've been able to find from my own research so far, this process, as John Dreisig mentioned, if anything, serve as an antidote to polarization and extremist perspectives. So this concern too seems to be utterly unfounded. Um, okay, so this was kind of the, the perhaps my top three uh, ghosts and specters haunting uh, discussions about citizens' assemblies in Portugal. Uh, what about the path moving forward? And well, I would, I would like to make a couple of points. The first of which is that is the Conselho de Cidadãos here in Lisbon, again, as in that, which ob, for the obvious reasons that it has at least brought us together here uh, to discuss this topic, which is undeniable a step in the direction of making these processes great, gain greater visibility here in Portugal. Um, a second part of the step to be the process to be carried out, and I think this is also applicable to the process that is about to be launched here in Lisbon, is that is a deepening and um, deepening uh, of the pro of the actual methodologies used, because so far the processes that have been organized and to some extent this Conselho do Cidadãos to here in Lisbon, they have got the nature of a pilot, something like a pilot study or a first run of sorts. And this is not because of any of the involved parties not wanting to do things better or not knowing that things, that the gold standard dictates something different. And this I can speak with, your, with some authority as a practitioner who typically is involved in making these things happen here, which is Things are not done differently most of the time because the budget allocated to them dictates that you've got to make do with what is available. And the still low legitimacy with which these processes are perceived by political institutions, most political, political institutions and other civil society organizations dictate that the budgets are allocated also in a kind of a conservative manner, let's put it that way. So uh, what's, uh, I would say that an important step would be kind of moving beyond the pilots, which are useful and important that they be carried out, but that we can once, that we can at some stage say, okay, we've, we've done enough experiments, we know this thing kind of works, and we've got ample international experience telling us that unless Portugal really exists on a different galaxy, it, it should work pretty well here too. 
And now let's try to do this for real, meaning without some of the compromises that invariably have to be done so f have had to be done so far when implementing them. Um, and um, as part of the, in parallel to this uh, process, I would uh, highlight a third point, which is the notion of institu institutionalization. And uh, the Conselho do Chidão here in Lisbon is also aiming to take that important step in line with what Ernesto was describing earlier, both the, Belgi the Belgian as well as the uh, Madrid experiences already kind of uh, being trailblazers and setting that path. And in this case, here in, we are actually quite close to the van international vanguard on that front. If the process in Lisbon becomes institutionalized, it will be one of the first around the world to actually be institutionalized. So we might kind of, uh, we might be actually jumping as uh, kind of, a, and I say this positively, to uh, uh, the current, the cusp of the international uh, discussion around these topics is precisely how to institutionalize the, the need to institutionalize processes of this nature so that they are no longer ad hoc consultative bodies that happen one on the specific topic on a particular year, but instead they've got some kind of standing and, and institutional backing and grounding to them. And this year in Lisbon would, uh, the process, the process um, becoming institutionalized over the coming years, if that uh, happens to be the case, then it will really place us in a very interesting place in terms of uh, municipalities uh, that have got an institution using the methods of citizen assemblies, but without the ad hoc character that hurts the legitimacy uh, of many of the prior experiences that have been held so far internationally. Um, good people, I would leave this, uh, I, I would end at this point, Roberto, I think I probably have, I don't know if I've had most of my time already, so yeah. I'll leave it at this, and thank you for your time, and I'll be happy to discuss later. Thank you very much, uh, Manuel. Um, okay, we have, actually, we have some minutes if, um, if you have some, any questions or so you want to just make some comments. Um, and I would like also to invite uh, Ernesto and John, if you have um, questions, please, um, about the Portuguese experiences with the deliberative democracy. Any question? I, I, I have to say that I really enjoyed the moving beyond the pilots. That's, that's, uh, that's... That's his recurring pain, right? It's like... Yeah. But, but let me say that one, this is, I mean, maybe more a sort of personal note on that. But I think that, and I'm saying this also because of the role of ICS, the... Um, um, the contribution that uh, we can uh, do by monitoring and evaluating uh, these initiatives is also, to me, a step towards, um, let's say, an institutionalization of these initiatives. I don't know if it's already the institutionalization of the Citizens' Council, but for sure it's uh, something that can provide um, a more robust information, more robust set of data, which can help actually decide whether it, it is the case or not to institutionalize the citizens, uh, the citizens council. And in my experience with the European Commission on this uh, task about the evaluation of uh, citizen participation, uh, I have to say that I found very little evidence of evaluation of these initiatives, which to me is a problem. Um, because reproduces somehow this piloting, everlasting piloting participation. So, yeah. Okay, sorry. So, if I don't know if you have something to say. Yeah, please. Uh, I have here the micro the and I'll, I'll take advantage of that. I would like to know how can we overcome the risk of um, this uh, Lisbon Council uh, of Citizens or another that is um, promoted by a uh, newly um, uh, government of the city, um, being just put aside when there are elections and again and the other uh, party or other coalition can win. 
how can we overcome that risk and uh, have a, um, a more solid and permanent uh, assembly of citizens? I, I might defer the question to what else, uh, your, not because I don't have my own opinion, but I think it might be the ideal. Uh, we, we should first uh, let Lorenzo uh, <laughs> present the, the citizens' council, maybe. I don't know, but I don't know, Lorenzo. Sure, good question. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. So thanks, everyone. So, Roberto, I think it's really important for you to have organized this event. And, um, and I think that when the city council uh, is up and running, I think we will feel the difference uh, of, uh, of uh, having done this event or not. So these contributions will have an impact, uh, will be, of course, taken into account uh, during the organization of such event. And I think uh, when the city council, the city council is uh, is present at these events, we need to be here uh, with a, a humble state of mind. I think this is the way that um, every public institution should should present itself, especially when conducting these um, disruptive initiatives such as a deliberative um, method here in Lisbon. And so I have bad news for Manel. Uh, we're running a pilot. I'm with you, yeah, you should. Yeah, you should. No, but um, but really, this is something uh, quite new in Lisbon. I think it's something quite new in Portugal, and so uh, it's not that we should start sm small, but we should uh, we should uh, be very uh, careful about uh, how we treat these exercises because we can ruin uh, we can ruin this exercise for everyone else, and uh, we are aware of that. And so this is why uh, we try to cooperate with uh, civil society and with academia. This is why I'm here next to Manel and next to, to Roberto. Uh, this is why we are running such sessions where we can learn from, uh, from uh, everyone else in the room. This is why uh, we, tend to, we tend to talk to international specialists such, such as uh, John and Ernesto, and, um, and, uh, which is also why we try to be very transparent. So we want everything about this project to be published online. We want it to be uh, in streaming. We want uh, the sortition process to be um, open to everyone to see and uh, evaluate the, the methods that we used. Um, and these are uh, not only ways that we have to, to learn from, uh, from uh, other points of view uh, and eventually from, uh, from attacks that we can, may get, but it's also a way for us to, uh, to, be, uh, to make sure that uh, the next Citizen Council uh, is it's even better and that other cities can use this example as well in Portugal and, uh, and elsewhere. And so maybe um, maybe uh, discuss uh, how this will be organized so for those uh, of you who have already uh, um, consulted our website you should know this is a, um, a, a council that will have 50 citizens randomly selected uh, so we'll have this selection going uh, through five criteria actually the age gender we have professional uh, the professional situation uh, the place of uh, the, the neighborhood where people reside or study or work, um, uh, their level of studies and uh, of schooling, basically, and uh, and that's it. These uh, five criteria. Uh, we believe that too much uh, might uh, make a sample uh, become too complex and too difficult to manage, and so we believe these are the five basic criteria necessary to have the the population of the city uh, represented at the city council so they will gather for uh, two days uh, a weekend in may so in in about a month and um and they will um they will be uh, discussing uh, this uh, this is i think the first time i, I will reveal the the topic in public so everybody is ready for this so they will be discussing climate change um, and uh, they will be discussing three questions mainly. The first is how does climate change impact my everyday life in the city? So how do I feel the impact of uh, climate change? How it's, it's about gaining ownership of the problem and understanding how uh, it concerns you. Uh, the second part of the question is what can I do about it and what am I uh, available to do? Uh, and the third question, which is the most important question, is what the, can the city do about it? Okay, so, and, and in particular, what the, can the city councillor and the mayor and the executive do about it? Okay, and this third part of the question will be 
where the participants will focus uh, the, the, the largest part of the, the time. And at the end, we want uh, specific uh, proposals. Uh, we don't want too many proposals, too many suggestions for the citizens because it will, it will make them impossible to implement. If we want real impact, we estimate that we should have around three to five concrete proposals from this group of citizens. Okay, And, um, and so it's important that these proposals also and this is part of our job in the in the briefings that we give to facilitators. It's important that uh, these question these uh, proposals uh, are um, are very well framed within the city council's uh, um, powers. Okay, so it's not obvious for uh, everyone what is the responsibility of the city, what is the responsibility of the state, what is the this responsibility of uh, the freguesia, so the neighborhood governance and um, and so there is a first part of this uh, council where we uh, need to provide information to participants not only information about climate change and how it is an issue for uh, everyone in the city but also about the city council's uh, powers and ability to do something about it okay if, for instance if you, if they want to discuss the enlargement of the the subway uh, network it's not it's not uh, part of the the city's job it's something that uh, is handled by directly by the the central state and so these type of uh, questions are not easy for everyone to understand and so the first part of this uh, council will naturally be about delivering information information about the city's uh, um, power uh, information about uh, climate change information about what other cities are doing about climate change um, and also information about what uh, each person each citizen can do uh, about it as well okay so this is the topic uh, this is uh, more or less the context in which we are uh, we are doing this it's important to say that the citizens will be selected uh, by an independent ngo which is uh, which is uh, um, Forum do that uh, that Manel leads uh, and um, and so this is this is important to ensure transparency um, monitoring and evaluation will be handled by an academic institution uh, here represented by, by Roberto and so there is little room facilitation of course the, we are hiring independent facilitators so the idea is to have no room for political intervention in the process and to guarantee full uh, transparency uh, so that uh, we have a genuine uh, outcome at the end um, we will do it at the city council, okay, so at the city council's locations, uh, and we will do it in the room where you usually have deliberation between different political parties and uh, where decisions are taken precisely to, um, to transmit this message of the importance of this process. And I think, uh, uh, I think uh, John mentioned it, the, the, the way you, you, you invite people uh, and these small uh, symbolic gestures uh, are actually very important. And so this is a sign of, uh, of the importance of the process. Um, I think um, I think we'll soon be able to uh, to tell you who the speakers will be. We'll have at first we'll have some speakers, uh, some specialists jumping in the session, and um, and of course discussing climate change. Very soon we'll have the agenda of the session and who these people are, and of course we'll have their their profile made uh, made public for uh, for transparency purposes. Um, and that's it. At the end, we want to have a session directly with the executive and with the mayor where people will uh, present their proposals uh, they will discuss these proposals with the with the mayor so we want to have plenty of time for that for questions for challenges for uh, the the executive really to feel what the the the, the concerns of the people are and um, and to gain ownership of those proposals um, i think we learned from other uh, processes around the globe and uh, one thing that we 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 understood is that if we if you run this type of processes uh, and at the end there is no impact you have the opposite result so people won't believe that uh participating um, matters okay so you you do um, you, what you need to do is to make sure that at the end you generate a positive impact on this in, even if you don't implement these measures 
uh, you need to explain why you need to have a, a permanent dialogue with uh, participants you know between politician policy makers and uh, and, and uh, citizens and if you have this and if you have transparency then you can guarantee that uh, these people will uh, will actually want to participate again and uh, become more engaged citizens. And so this point of impact is uh, is crucial for us. And uh, we want to, we're thinking of doing something that I think is quite uh, new in this type of processes, which is having some representatives of this sample. So it's 50 people. Let's, let's say we have uh, five or 10 people that are elected by these, uh, like spokespeople, uh, spokesmen, spokeswomen that are elected by uh, the the participants and we will uh, keep on working with the city council on the implementation of their proposals okay so you you need to have a period of evaluation of the proposals can we do this uh, when can we do this is this feasible is this within our responsibilities or not do we have the political conditions to do it uh, and uh, and afterwards you have to of course uh, work with the uh, citizens to to implement them and so we're thinking of having like these uh, working groups uh, with participants uh, with some some of the participants that can uh, do the follow up um, for implementing these measures these proposals and so uh, ensuring uh, that uh, they have a, a real impact and so I think that this is basically it about the the, the Lisbon, uh, the new citizen uh, council. Uh, let me say this is a pilot, this is a first edition, and so uh, like I said, we need to be very careful about the way we run things. This is why we were calling it a pilot at first. It's not for uh, economic or budget or financial uh, reasons. It's really because uh, we we are the largest city in the country. We are a European capital. We need to get it right. Okay. Uh, and so um, we need to keep open to uh, make change j changes in the model, to listen to experts, to uh, listen to, to to learn from the evaluation and monitoring that uh, that the ICS is uh, is doing, and then to adapt things in the in the next edition. And maybe the next edition will be the the. Um, uh, the one that uh, we'll assume will be uh, carried on in the future. But uh, for now, as this is the first one, we want to make clear this is a pilot and that there, there is room for learning, there is room for changing and improving. Okay, And, um, and maybe to answer the question that was previously uh, asked about institutionalizing this, um, it's not just about... Uh, having the will or uh, making the decision you need to have the political conditions to do it okay and so um we know that uh, and you know that in the in the the city council the, the current executive does not have majority neither in the city assembly or in the city uh, executive uh, and so this makes it more uh, delicate to uh, to start with institutionalizing i think it would take uh, a lot of time paris took around uh, two years if i'm not mistaken uh, and so these things take time, a lot of discussion, and there uh, you you are also vulnerable to political uh, timings. Um, and, um, and so it's not that we, we didn't want to wait, but we do believe that we need to prove the value of this exercise and, uh, and those experiences will help us then have the necessary arguments to uh, institutionalize this, um, this exercise, okay? So, so this is why we're not doing it at first. Uh, it's a process. It's within, of course, our ambitions. But, um, but let's start with proving the value of this exercise. And uh, I think that's it. Uh, I think I covered the, the, not every detail, of course, but uh, the, the general idea of, uh, of the initiative. Uh, and um, let's go into questions. Thank you, Lorenzo. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure that uh, there are questions. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so um, let me take the mic is with you. Yeah, right. okay. And uh, yeah, uh, sorry, before, before we start with the questions here in the room, uh, I can see John is uh, online. Ernesto, if you are and you want to switch on your camera, in case you want to ask something about, I don't know, whether the... Are you listening? No. 
Yeah, yeah. Ah, okay, sorry. Uh, in case you want to ask uh, something to uh, Manel uh, about about the Portuguese experience, uh, um, and uh, of course uh, Lorenzo about the Lisbon uh, uh, Citizen Council, uh, maybe we can uh, uh, first take your questions and then go back to the room. I don't know if you have any, or if. No, okay. Just, it, it's just a question about uh, the political agenda, how, how it's going to be organized. Uh, in, no, in not the first time, just the, the, the sequence of the political agenda in the, in the next steps of the, of the Lisbon Council. Okay. No? Okay, clear. Uh, so before, uh, John, did you want to ask uh, something as well? Uh, yeah. Um, should, should I give my question now or just wait? Uh, we can, we can take it now if you if you feel if you wish. Yeah, but um, actually it was just it's really a, a, a sort of an observation on um, on Manuel's uh, point uh, where he mentioned uh, uh, the the idea of Portuguese exceptionalism, and <laughs> it, it did make me wonder about the um, the degree to which we we can take well all, all the findings that I referred to in, in my talk, um, to what extent can we take them everywhere? Um, and I think I assume that we can, um, but maybe uh, uh, maybe we need to be a bit more careful about uh, uh, sort of thinking about, um, uh, well, to try and think if there are, I think we know that there are cultural varieties and deliberative practices when it comes to informal deliberation in the public sphere, um, but in the formalized Uh, context of, um, of citizens' assemblies and many public. So I, I'm not sure that the differences are that great, but I have no evidence. Uh, so that's um, yeah, something to think about anyway. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Uh, I, um, who wants to, I don't know, Lorenzo? Help? Just, just this... Um about this um, this topic of the political agenda. So I, I'm guessing your question is about who chooses the topics for each discussion, for each um, citizen council. And uh, and here uh, is, of, of course, the executive. The, the mayor and the executive choose the topics for a simple reason, which is that they are elected, they identify the priorities for the city, and you need to guarantee that uh, this is a contribution to that governance, okay? If uh, you would have a topic that is completely different from the priorities uh, of an elected executive, then the chances of impact of this executive actually doing something about it are quite low, okay? Are very reduced. And so you need to have, um, you need to have um, uh, this, uh, you need to be able to, give, to offer the executive Uh, the possibility to listen first and then decide on what they believe are the priorities for the city. Okay, so this for for this first edition, the mayor has chosen uh, climate change. Uh, I don't know for the others. Uh, I'll go uh, one step at a time. But uh, but he has identified uh, climate change as one of top top three priorities for Lisbon, and I think everybody agrees on that. And, uh, and so he wants to listen first to the citizens and then take action. And, and, and also, let me say this. This is something we also learned from other countries, uh, other executives. If you take this example, uh, you remember the Gilets Jaunes in France. Uh, and they, became, they, they, they began when uh, Macron, um, and not to criticize Macron, which was, uh, we need to congratulate him today, but, uh, uh, but I remember he, he decided to raise taxes on, on gas. And, uh, and that was an environmental measure, naturally. But uh, this, was, this was done against the will of the people. This was done uh, creating friction in a, around a topic that should be consensual. And that should uh, get everyone aligned behind it, which is climate change, of course. And when you do things against people and not um, with people, uh, what you get is friction. And, uh, and of course, uh, you get uh, more and more extremism, more and more populism that is uh, feeding on this. Uh, and I think that the, the logical here, uh, it's completely uh, the opposite, is precisely to reduce that friction 
and uh, to make sure that uh, in very important topics such as climate change, you need to do things with people. So you need to listen first, you need to understand what their concerns are, how uh, climate change impacts their lives, and uh, with that, you uh, decide on which policies should be implemented at the city level and on the timings of the implementation of those uh, policies. Okay. So this is the idea, uh, the vision that motivated um, the cities and council in Lisbon. Okay, let's take some uh, questions. I one, two, three, uh, four. Do you have the mic there, right? Yeah, you have. So, can you please? Anna, you, you want to ask a question? So. Okay, so please. Um, my, my, my question is for. My question is for uh, um, Lorenzo uh, uh, about the, uh, the council, the Citizens Council. Uh, I would like to know how is uh, make the, the the choice of the the participants for the for the council. Okay, so, uh, so there are a, a criterion. If there are yes, there. I mean, they are chosen by, by random selection. Okay, uh, so which is the typical method uh, in a, in a citizen. Uh, jury panel assembly parliament uh, council forum uh, etc uh, uh, but uh, it's uh, it's according to five criteria to make sure that you have uh, the demographics let's say of of the population that are uh, represented within this sample and these criteria are age gender professional situation so are they employed employed or do they work in a company are they independent uh, entrepreneurs whatever uh, and uh, the neighborhood where they reside study or work so the freguesia uh, and their uh, school their level of uh, education of schooling the studies in they have independent of the of the um, uh, the the um, independentemente do tema do tema que esteja a ser que esteja a ser debatido, ou seja, independentemente yes. de, 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 das formações ou das ou, ou de, de maior ou menor conhecimento em função do tema que esteja a ser debatido. Yes. A minha questão tem a ver com isso, pronto. Yes. Okay, sorry. Just to for John Thank and you. Ernesto, she's asking whether the um, stratified random selection is based on uh, the let's say the degree of knowledge about the topic that will be uh, discussed and the answer is uh, no there is no connection so the the, the, the selection is made uh, independently by the topic which is uh, uh, proposed by the city city council by the city council and, and it, that's the point i mean the, the, the idea he, here is to have uh, the everyday citizen uh, and uh, to collect his, his uh, or her experience uh, around that topic. Okay, if you would have a, a sample of people that know a lot about this, it would not be a citizen assembly. Okay. Yeah, there is a question. There. there are, uh, okay, thank you very much uh, for the presentations. And uh, I have a, guess, a question that um, I think it was raised, the topic was brought throughout the, all your presentations, and it concerns the relationship between, um, in this case, the Council of Citizens, but it could be other participatory forums, their relationship with political actors. Um, and I say, of course, this is not meant to be a political actor, and that's very clear. But how do you relate this? How do you, do you bring political actors in? I mean, it can be opposition parties, it can be uh, members of the executive. I'm not talking about Lisbon in particular, so it's a question that can be addressed to any of the speakers, if there's any literature in this. Because, for instance, when I was doing research and I was doing this on the um, state building, constitution building in Timor-Leste, and the UN, the United Nations, they wanted to make public consultations, and they did it to citizens throughout the country, to um, 
write the new constitution. And that was perceived by the most voted party as a way of emptying their power. And of course, that generate, generated a great friction. And at some point, even though it was a majoritarian party for Italy and there was no substantial opposition power, it was perceived public as the UN versus Fratelli. And I think I'm giving this as an example. This was in 1999, so it's something very distant. And I'm sure that it's all that, uh, something that we all want to avoid when we talk about participation. So I'm asking if there's any input, how to take this into account, how to avoid some pitfalls, and yeah, just wanted to hear some feedback on this. Thank you. Let me first check uh, if uh, also John and Ernesto, did you hear the question? Did, could you? No, okay, so. Uh, not, not so well, uh, I, I can hear some of that. But. Okay, sorry. Uh, so maybe I can try to <laughs> uh, sum it up. Uh, it's about the, um, the role of these uh, deliberative uh, initiatives uh, in the um, political sphere, uh, political parties. Um, so what's the role uh, of these uh, initiatives uh, when considering you know, the political party struggle? So how does this, how does uh, the, uh, for example, the Citizens Council in Lisbon uh, relate to uh, the executive um, uh, the executive powers, but also the oppositions, and uh, so the interplay between uh, participation and deliberation and the political system. Yes, and if I may add, I, I don't know if you can hear me better now. No. Okay, yeah. Yes, how to bring political actors, how to make them buy the, the importance, so to say, of these bodies, mm -hmm. not to generate conflicts between powers mm -hmm. and one and the others yeah and also to how to raise awareness in political actors about the importance of this uh, type of participatory and deliberative exercises with uh, with citizens so roughly speaking this is the question uh let me first ask if uh, i don't know if you want to provide any input on that if you have any experience of these tensions or or not between the political parties and uh, these bodies? Um, do you want? Um, yeah, I, uh, I, I can say something if you like. Uh, yeah, please. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. I, I think ideally uh, one would like uh, the introduction of any deliberative process to be supported by all, 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 all the parties um, who are present. Um, because otherwise, and I think we see this, this happening in, in many places, that um, uh, you know, a government, well, it could be a city government, it could be a, a national government or a regional government, um, uh, controlled by one party or one coalition, um, institutes, uh, in, institutes a program of citizen deliberation, and then uh, they feed it at an election, and then it, it, all, it all disappears. Um, and that's, um, I mean, I can give several examples of that, um, where, where, where that's happened. Um, and and that, that's really unfortunate. Um, uh, so, yeah, so I think, I, as I say, ideally, uh, it's important to get support from, from all parties. And I, and I think that, I don't know, maybe, maybe, I don't know the, what the key is um, for, for doing this, but um, I've always thought that if, um, you know, if, if you have faith, as a politician in the power of your own position, uh, then you should um, be, be willing to um, have citizens deliberate it and see see what they think uh, and see if they agree with you. But um, but that's um, uh, you know that, that's obviously asking uh, politicians to adopt deliberative, deliberative virtues, um, which they, they may have sometimes, but not but not always. And of course, they're engaged in a strategic game as well. Um, but but I think um, you know, some of the more perhaps some of the more successful examples of um, of, of effective citizen liberation and having an impact um, uh, come come from cases where where they did where support has been from all the major parties. So I'm thinking of Ireland again, where 
um, all, the, all the major parties not only uh, not only supported the citizens' assemblies, but in, in one of them they all participated in it as well. So, so that would be the ideal. Yeah. Thank you, John. Uh, Ernesto, do you? Uh... Um, I, I think it's quite interesting question and it's quite challenging. It's a quite challenge. It's the relation is another way to. I think for me, it's another political logic. And sometimes it's quite difficult to articulate the deliberation with the political struggles of political parties. So I agree that it's quite, it's, it will be a very nice, a very good idea just to, to have an agreement, a commitment with all political parties with the deliberative experience. Otherwise, it's like, for example, in Madrid experience, once the government lost the municipal elections, the experience disappear. Um, it, this is a, the, the risk um, with, with the liberation and political parties, but it's just not only political parties, but also social movements, for example. Um, now, for example, in Valencia, there were a citizen assembly about mental health. Um, social movements around mental health was very disappointing with the citizen assembly because they were talking some very complicated issue. Um, social movements feel out of the political discussion. So it's, it's I think this is a challenge because the logic of the deliberative deliberation is different and we have to be, uh, we, we have to take to care about that, uh, not, just not think that because the relation is good, is going to be very good for, for the other, other stakeholders. It's not. That's it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ernesto. Um, okay, let's take uh, another question. Um, uh, can I? <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I want to start. I want to start with the uh, one experience, uh, Turkish experience. I'm from Turkey. We have uh, more than tr 20 years. We have uh, this type of organizations, institutions like citizen assemblies. Uh, I made a r uh, field research in my uh, master thesis about the citizen assemblies in Turkey. In uh, in our experience. Uh, our citizen assemblies are uh, financially uh, totally dependent to the municipality and uh, this uh, this makes uh, this decrease their uh, power for uh, deciding about the uh, ab about criticizing municipality or uh, put another agenda for the municipalities uh, and I'm I'm curious about your system uh, and also the you, you mentioned uh, Lorenzo, Lorenzo you mentioned that uh, the final decisions of citizen assemblies will argue with the mayor so oh, this can be uh, how can I say this can be sometimes uh, tricky I'm, I I couldn't understand the that part uh, how it's this how this process be much uh, comprehensive with the uh, opposition party uh, deputies in uh, municipal council or the other stakeholders in the city like uh, NGOs or uh, other stakeholders so I'm curious about that part how uh, this process much be transparent and uh, be a agenda of the city, not only for the municipal executives. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Did you did you listen to the question? Do you need me to? Okay. Thank you. That's that's actually a great question. Um, I think the 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 moment where. Um, where citizens discuss their proposals with the mayor is crucial because 
He's the one accountable for uh, the success of the exercise mm -hmm. and for the impact of these measures. So it's crucial that he listens from participants uh, and that he discusses with them and that you have, uh, of course, uh, proposals are built by this uh, sample of participants. But the, 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 the idea behind this is a, a, an almost a co-construction of uh, uh, policies within the city. Uh, and so this moment, this interaction, I think, is uh, is very important. At the end of the day, it's not the civil society, it's not the opposition is, uh, that are responsible for implementing those measures. It's uh, the mayor. So if you, it's it's, uh, I think it's, uh, of course, it needs uh, you need brave uh, politicians to do that because they need to um, they need to have the courage to uh, to become accountable for for that. Uh, but um, but that doesn't mean you exclude all the rest. Uh, and I think uh, the secret here is transparency. I think uh, we also we often face this argument uh, uh, where uh, political parties, civil society movements are almost afraid of uh, of these exercises because they feel that their power is reduced in face of uh, giving more power to citizens. I, I, that's not that's not our our point of view. Uh, we think this is complementary. I mean. Uh, every, there is room for everyone. There is a different role for uh, everyone, and um, and I think um, and I think that what the city council needs to do afterwards uh, is to, in order to implement a certain measure, a certain proposal, they need to work together with different players to do so. Okay, uh, as they work together with different players to put the citizen as, uh, assembly together in the first place. Okay, so that should be the attitude of the city, the, the city council at all times, uh, and it won't be different uh, after a citizen uh, uh, council. It will be quite the opposite. And so transparency, I think, is the rule here. Publishing everything about the sessions, all the results, uh, making making it uh, visible for uh, uh, the civil, civil civil society movements, opposition parties, answering all questions doing sessions such as this one. And so uh, I think that's the key to it. But uh, at the end, um, the executive is responsible for the exercise and is responsible for working together with different players to implement the measures. Uh, I would like to briefly jump in with regard to both the last two questions we just heard, um, because I think it might help to put um, a bit of an historical, uh, things in an historical perspective in the sense that we are at a stage in terms of the use of citizens' assemblies and similar processes where uh, they happen through a decision of an office holder, but they are, well, let, let me rephrase. Basically, these participatory processes, unlike our idealized vision of civil engagement by the citizenry, is a top-down institutionalized one. And this makes it different from most forms of political engagement by ordinary citizens that we commonly relate to as desirable. Uh, they are not, uh, they, th these processes don't have an emergent nature. They are not bottom up. Instead, they are typically, they are not typically, they are invariably, as far as I know, organized in a top down fashion by an institution, be it a public uh, political institution, a private philanthropic one or a consortium of several institutions of these sorts. And this can be a bit confusing because the moment we are talking about a process that is necessarily led and financed and commissioned by an institution, if we have political institutions in the mix of the institutions that are commissioning the process, we will necessarily have a discussion about independence and who is making this happen and whose agenda is this fitting. And I believe that we are at a part and that's where historical an historical perspective comes in as far as I can tell, which is we are at a, these are processes that tendentially aim to be institutional in nature, but currently in the vast majority of places where they unfold, they happen through the ad hoc discretionary decision of an office holder. So, because they aim at being institutional in nature, and at the same time, currently, they only happen because dude A, B, or C, who occupies some public office, decided to use part of the budget of that institution to make it happen. 
we are at this crossroads and there's a tension here that we, I think, just reflects the situation in the evolution of these processes where we find ourselves in. Okay, So personally, this helps me. I, I totally share the, the underlying uh, hesitation and doubts. And I think it, they are me mostly a reflection of the process, uh, the part of the process we are in. Thanks. Okay, let's take... Yeah, another question. Uh, how many questions do we have? Just to one, two, and three. Okay, let's take these three and then... Uh, good morning to everyone. Thank you, Roberto, for this uh, meeting and this conference. And, uh, Mr. Lawrence, also for uh, the, um, the opportunity of doing another uh, participatory uh, um, instrument and process in, in Lisbon. Professor John Dreisig and Professor Ernesto uh, Ganuza and also Manuel Riaga. The thing that the, the thing that you are bringing the the this um, the assemblies uh, are not uh, a, a new th a new uh, uh, are not uh, new news really because this is a. What was happening in the ancient Greek, uh, ancient Greece, so like the Chlorotherian machine and uh, that kind of sorts of things that are, that are very interesting and uh, came, came, are coming back uh, again. This is very interesting. I have uh, so, some thoughts um, uh, and uh, uh, probably uh, suggestion for, for the future. Um, uh, how do this process is going to um, to be integrated or, or run uh, with the other processes that are already being been taking the uh, action in Lisbon, like participatory budgeting, uh, public tenders, public consultations. Um, are, are, is they, they are not going to be uh, overcome or cannibalized <laughs> one with just always always. Uh, thinking uh, about how we, were, how we were thinking about integrating this uh, like uh, uh, multi-channel participa uh, participation pr uh, processes, and uh, I, I don't know if um, it's like a, su a suggestion. I, I, I think in uh, two or three years ago, I've I've, I've speak with this way with uh, Mr. Manuel Riaga about doing if in, if in this case we are doing a pilot. Uh, why not uh, doing it, uh, for, for instance, uh, or in the first uh, first instance, with the, the municipal workers? Uh, for for example, one of the, of the things that, that we've uh, we've been uh, looking, I think this this is uh, um, this is real. I don't know the numbers uh, now, but more than uh, fifty percent, probably a lot of more than fifty percent of, of uh, uh, municipal workers don't belong, for example, to a, a union or a political party or whatever. Uh, that will be interesting also to do like a sortition or a, a random panel to uh, to um, to discuss. Uh, situations or uh, measures that that will be that, that can be uh, be taken in, in, the, in the municipality of Lisbon. So just like a suggestion. Okay. Thank you, Paulo. So the question is about the articulation of the citizens' council with the other participatory tools uh, in Lisbon. I, I would suggest let's take the other two questions and then. Uh, so yeah, please the mic there. Hi. Thank you. So my question is a bit more broad. Um, sometimes we talk about deliberative democracy as a solution to the gap that citizens feel between themselves and politics. And uh, But then obviously we need to choose a limited number of people to take part in these real opportunities for participation. So I intuitively, I think this may mean that the other people who are not selected, who cannot actually take part in these exercises, may feel even more excluded. Um, or, or maybe um, the result is indifference towards the whole process. I'm not sure. So what I'm asking is, what other complementary strategies can we put in place, or what can we do so as to ensure that um, that deliberative democracy um, is also more participatory or can actually be used to um, straight uh, to narrow this gap that is felt uh, more and more in a lot of countries nowadays. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if, oh, okay, you listen. Uh, do you need, uh, yeah. Hello. 
So, um, my, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah okay. So, uh, my question has to do with um, what Lorenzo was saying about the justification for this to be a, a pilot project, because you want to take it carefully and be sure that uh, you take uh, as least mistakes as possible, because frustration processes in these cases can be quite dangerous and can compromise the whole the success of the whole process. And uh, my question is also related with what uh, Manel was saying and what John was saying previously about uh, the amount of success cases that you have to s that support the, uh, the creation uh, of this uh, kind of uh, deliberative um, moments. And um, that made me think like if we are just um, if you are just learning or supporting these initiatives from the success stories and, uh, and um, the good results that we hear from these processes, or if you are also taking consideration if there is any space to learn also from, from the mistakes of these uh, international examples, because that could help in a great way to not to uh, go back to the same, because there is a lot of examples apparently, so if you're also taking that in consideration. Okay, so uh, this uh, third question is about, if I, uh, if I understood correctly, is about the capacity to learn from uh, the other experiences in uh, deliberative experiences in the because world. Because normally you only share like the positive results and the good stories yeah. to support the, yeah, the exactly. creation of these Basically, processes. And, and also to prevent from the same Exactly, problems. because there is quite okay. a, a, a great danger of, of these processes too. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, Manuel, Lorenzo. Sure, I can go. So, uh, also, yeah, and also John and Ernesto, if you want to jump in, please just okay, thank you. Okay, so I think we have four questions. First question is about um, how does uh, this citizen council um, works together with other participatory uh, exercises from the city council? I think. Uh, again, I think there's room for everything uh, and I think there's need for even more. Uh, and if you look at the numbers uh, in Portugal of uh, political participation, uh, of uh, voting, of uh, it's, it's quite low. Uh, and um, and uh, um, some say that uh, that's uh, our democracy that still needs to gain some maturity. I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. But I do know that we need more of these exercises. And, uh, and these are very different exercises. When you do a participatory budget, um, it's, it's, actually, it's actually a different, uh, different process. It's a necessary process. It's a successful uh, exercise, but, um, but uh, it's different. It's just, uh, it's just a different level. Uh, it's a different methodology. It's a different goal. Um, you're actually giving people money to uh, so that they, they can decide what to do with that money, which is uh, very, very interesting. Here, you are more considering the municipal budget as, uh, as the target of this discussion, more than a, a certain amount that you, would, uh, that you would select. So it's a different, uh, very different exercise, and I think we need both. Um, I, I did. I did the, like the idea of doing this with municipal workers. Uh, I think again, it's a it's a, it's a different exercise as well. I think uh, you should uh, target different topics, different challenges. Uh, it's a different background. Uh, I think it's very necessary uh, that you uh, run more participatory exercises with uh, with uh, municipal workers. Uh, and that you listen to them uh, at first and understand what their concerns are, what their struggles are, and, and to empower them. But uh, there are uh, a large number of exercises you can do uh, to, to this purpose uh, and not just uh, citizen assemblies. I'm not sure if it's the right methodology to achieve these goals. Uh, it could be. It's open to discussion. But anyways, I, 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 I did appreciate the idea. Uh, well, you could do a pilot. I think that's, that's uh, you got the idea. Um, 
about there was one question about the feeling of not being uh, chosen uh, when um, when you enrolled in the uh, citizen assembly and at the end you were not selected i think uh, you, you you asked the question I, I don't know if there are any empirical studies on that and i i'll let that to john ernesto and, and manel but uh, i think you can you can have both ways at the end Uh, you could feel more excluded or you could feel happy that this exercise is going on and 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 so uh, even if you're not uh, chosen uh, you do feel glad that this is uh, actually taking place uh, I, I i don't know i don't know what are the studies on that but uh, what i know is that uh, this is not the only participatory uh, initiative that you should have within a city or within a country or within a neighborhood Uh, and so uh, I think we need more of those and we need uh, democratic innovation around this um, as quick as possible. Uh, and uh, to answer you, your question around what we, we did use over 40 studies uh, to, um, to uh, develop the, met the methodology for the city, cities and council in Lisbon. Uh, and so there, uh, there is this uh, more academic background to do to it. But we are also taking risks, things that weren't on the studies that we are doing something new. For instance, when I mentioned having uh, spokespeople from uh, this uh, sample that uh, will follow up on the topic and uh, work with the city city council uh, team to implement these measures. For instance, this is not something we found on the studies. So it's a risk, of course. It's an innovation. Uh, but uh, it's it's where we might learn something. Uh, and so it's a mix of both. So we're taking a few necessary risks, but of course controlled risks that we believe will bring a value added to the process. Uh, but we, we have a strong... Uh, Uh, academic uh, background to this uh, to this methodology of course and and i have to say uh, of course Roberto and Manel really helped uh, in building that i'm happy to briefly engage but uh, i'm actually curious to listen to our colleagues john and their last answer in particular to inesh question over there because I've, <laughs> i i i would love to broaden the discussion on that particular topic yeah i don't know john and dennis do you know of any empirical study about the feeling of being even more excluded by these uh, deliberative exercises um I, I don't know of any empirical study. Um, that, 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 that's a good question. I mean, it would be interesting to, to uh, do, do a study of the people who, who responded to the initial invitation, say that they'd be willing to participate, but then are not, are not selected, and whether that actually increases their alienation from the system. I, I think um, there, there are things you can do with those people. Um, uh, so I, I mentioned the um, Australian Citizens Parliament that I helped organise, and um, What we did there was um, we um, invited people to um, uh, join in an online process. It was not the, it was not exactly um, a deliberative process, but they um, could uh, form online groups um, around common interests, and then they could present uh, a conclusion or a, even a recommendation that would then be deliberated at the Citizens Parliament itself. Um, so that's one that's one thing that um, it might be possible to do. But I think the the, the big um, the way I heard that that, that question, the, the big question was well, um, uh, many publics are presented as a solution to bridging the gap between citizens and 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 politics and policy making, but. Um, If, it's, if they're limited to a, a small number of citizens, really a very tiny number of citizens, um, then the large majority, I mean, if they know that the mini public citizens assembly is happening, uh, um, may, may feel um, excluded. Um, so I think, um, I, I think there's a lot of work to be done there on trying to figure out how to link in to a broader, um, a broader public. And so how can you do that? Well, I've already mentioned the, what we did with the, the Australian Citizens Parliament. So you could sort of try and organize um, online groups at a meeting, um, perhaps even self-organizing in connection with the, uh, the, the Citizens Council. Um, it would be possible to um, have its uh, proceedings covered in the media, um, uh, uh, television, print media, um, maybe even have um, uh, you know, interactive social media streams going on in conjunction with um, 
with the sitting for liberation. Um, and then just one final thing I, I mentioned uh, in, in connection with the, the Global Citizens Assembly on genome and what we're doing, we're, we've got a documentary film company uh, which is going to which is going to make science documentaries essentially about well essentially two science documentaries about the the, the gene editing issue, and then third will be a delivery documentary on citizen deliberation, and that, that that those will get they will get viewed by millions of people around the world. Um, and so it's a way of uh, uh, um, at least uh, getting the the idea of citizen deliberation um, out there, even if the viewers can't directly participate in, themselves. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Very good inputs. Uh, Ernesto, I don't know if you wanted to say something, Ernesto, or... Um, just to implement what she says, says. I, I don't know any empirical study, but I know that people is doing research about this topic just now. Um, in a European, in a Horizon 2020 project, uh, they are really thinking uh, a plan to, to research this. And about the other things, I think that uh, I like just one proposal of one Canadian who was really promoting deliberative in many publics. Uh, it's around the, the connection between mini publics and the large majority that it's quite disconnected about the, the deliberations. But he used to say that uh, uh, once the liberty mini publics are quite common, it can allow to participate many different people. So, it's a, if once the liberation, the liberty experience achieves to be a reference in the logic of political organization, it can allow many people. In, just to be involved in a deliberative experience. I think that this is the, the major question because I don't think so that the, the, the TV or press or something like that is going to, to work a lot. It's more that really people can participate in as much as deliberative or mini parties as they can. And to, to just ask them, just until the deliberative experience of mini parties are claimed by people, um, everything, every can, everyone can really have a chance to participate. That's all. Yeah. Okay, so I, I would like to briefly follow up on a, on two of these points. Um, so, um, well, one of them is that I do know, and I'm happy to, to share off a, a recently published uh, as of, I was actually bringing it, pulling it up, and it was in February um, of this year, a study by Saskia Goldberg and Besti and Andre Bestiger in, uh, in Germany, precisely on the perceptions of non-participating citizens in this kind of processes. And, um, and, and it's actually a very negative finding in the sense that uh, as, I, I believe was implicit in the in, in the question that non-participating citizens who are aware of a process of this kind and falling in a, again the, I believe these are university undergrad German undergraduate students as usually is the norm in this kind of um, social science research uh, um, but they, they, they've got somewhat negative perceptions towards the toward, towards the process I can pull it up I don't know where it was published it was in the British Journal of Political Science and uh, but besides this individual empirical finding which doesn't obviously by itself answer the broader question, um, I, I, would, I would make up a couple of points. The first is, there is a notion here, at st the fundamental notion at stake here for me is one of the perceived legitimacy of these processes, and in particular of this kind of representation, meaning representation by lot, as opposed to representation via delegation uh, or election, uh, which is what we are, we've been familiarized and socialized into believing is proper political representation over a solid couple of centuries. And um, these perceptions do change. Uh, work by um, in Bolivia, in school settings precisely, uh, by, um, and I miss the names, Adam Concrete and Simon something, I don't, sorry, Simon, uh, finds that, for example, school age uh, children, teenagers, when they become 
uh, when if when they test prior and post to a change in the school in the way the school government is run namely the school government is initially run in an electoral fashion as we are acquainted with and then is then it happens at, through a so, through sortition and random selection the prior initially it's seen as very illegitimate the the choice through random selection and after just a couple of years they find that the perception is drastically changed so this is a matter of i'm i'm stating the obvious more broadly speaking that social perceptions uh, change over time but it is helpful to remember that the, our perceptions about the legitimacy of mechanisms of political representation also change and this we are at the early stages of this process uh, uh, now nowadays in bringing it to a wider audience um in terms of the mistakes i would i would point out that i believe most most of the i would i would venture saying that most practitioners in the field have got quite a good feel for what the best ways are to screw up one of these processes and these are uh, they were already implicit also i believe in in john's some of the one of john's ways about what we know and um and or the lessons i believe that was it kind of for example very short duration um and not not assure not assuring there is like a con uh, constructive and uh, deliberation oriented process in place uh, poor fa poor facilitation um, the notion of there it being no clear connection between the process and the how the proposals being generated will actually be incorporated into the broader political system uh, I, I don't pretend by any means to suggest that we have all the all the answers obviously but to know that meaning that we know the major pit pitfalls um, I'd say I feel mildly, mildly confident that we've got some general notions of where to avoid stepping onto. Um, and without um, wanting to m m m t take any further time, I'll just bring up this. I think that in one of the slides we saw earlier, there was a reference to the deliberative system. And uh, I wouldn't so much speak of a deliberative system, but I think there is a a common misconception when we speak about citizens assemblies as a panacea or something that's going to magically solve many problems I, I think there's a category error there which is these mechanisms are intended as a complement or at some in some parts of the political system a replacement there i say it to selection through elections they are not meant to become the political system. But instead, what they are intending to do, or some of us propose they can be used for, is to replace some elected organs by organs selected bodies selected in this fashion. So there is no claim that elections enable all of us to participate in politics actively. Instead, they allow us to select in a particular way one component of the broader political system. And what is here at stake is merely a claim, which is already quite a radical one, I would say, that we, we might have an alternative mechanism and an alternative form for running some of the bodies which have actual decision-making power in our broader political system. So the, all the space necessary and vital as it is for broader participation, it should come through other mechanisms, I would say, into this broader uh, assemblage of uh, pathways for participation. So I, I'll leave it at this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel. Uh, well, um, thank you all. I think that we are uh, perfectly on time um, to close this uh, first seminar. So just to thank again the participation of our keynote speakers and also of the Citizen uh, Council uh, today and uh, to um, highlight again that this is the start of a new series so i should be able to announce soon the second seminar and hopefully also a third seminar in the next few weeks which will also cover the other uh, issues well actually looking at the citizens council from also other angles um, uh, I would like to uh, give a special uh, thank to John and Ernesto. I, I find it very annoying that you cannot see the room. So I, I want to try to do, let's see if this works, but just to give you, well, I, I cannot do more, but anyway, this is also how digital.
in prayers, some participation. Also in, uh, the, also in academic events. Anyway, thank you very much. It was uh, very interesting, very useful, I think. And uh, uh, see you soon. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.